Good morning. I'm Shivani from CII and I would like to extend a very warm welcome to day two of the Zero Project India Conference and CII IBDN National Conference. We are indeed glad to have you back with us today. And for those who are joining us only today, we extend a hearty welcome to you as well. We have an exciting day lined up and I would like to invite representatives from our partner organizations to give us a preview for day two. May I please invite Mr. Michael, Director Zero Project Austria, and Ms. Mira Shanoi, Founder and CEO, Youth for Jobs, to please explain how the day will flow. Thank you. I'm actually... Okay. You tell us what happened. Yeah. Warm welcome to all of you. Uh, what I'm going to do is I think we see many new faces here today. So we're going to give a quick two-minute wrap-up of what happened yesterday. So yesterday's panel one was a very interesting panel, power-packed power speeches. We had our secretary, Rajesh Agarwal. We had the chairman of CII, IBDN, Venkatraman. We have Shilpa of uh, the Omidyar. We had the deputy country director of ILO. And we had Martin, chairman SL, who began with very interesting uh, anecdotes and what needs to be done more importantly for this sector. Uh, then we released a, a, a playbook for accessible events. Those of you who don't have it, you can access it on the Youth for Jobs uh, website. This was followed by two interesting sessions, one which was high powered on technology and then we thought we should also talk about the real India, so we had innovations in rural livelihoods. Uh, that was yesterday. Now I'm going to request our partner, Michael, to give to tell you what's in store for you today. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Mira. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a kind of forecast of what's happening uh, today very briefly. Um, Everything that the Zero Project does is about uh, supporting innovation and uh, scaling processes in the area of disability, inclusion, and accessibility. We as the Zero Project, as you have heard yesterday, we are a global um, system, a global network, a global ecosystem, uh, and what we bring to India uh, is um, centered around having this global network, which is the Zero Project, and try to connect this uh, to India and uh, create impact on both sides of this end. So India and uh, our global network, which is um, focused uh, on, the, on the Zero Project Conference in India and the global research process on the most outstanding innovations. So bringing this together, uh, we uh, built together an agenda this, uh, this second day of the conference that focuses on six topics that we identified where we can bring uh, this Zero Project network and ideas and innovations and bring this to one conference day and these six sessions are first on impact investing so we have a great panel on, on impact investing both impact investors from india but also from outside india and they will engage with each other explain their models uh, and then also try to find common ground the second one is innovative innovative technologies in uh, job creation so job creation, vocational training is a lot uh, based and ever more increasingly so on innovative technologies. It's not only high tech, it's also low tech, and it's a lot on affordability and availability. Uh, and uh, this all will be covered in the second panel. The third one is on labs and on hubs. So I had a lot of interesting conversations here and also before. Many people, including me, believe that building hubs, building labs where people meet and come together uh, and have shared interests and shared networks, uh, this is uh, one of the strongest way to, to build innovations, to scale innovations. And we have um, lab and hub builders from three other countries and one from India here as well. So they also will share the experiences, how to run uh, and how to build and how to scale hub solutions. The fourth is on cooperation on data, uh, and uh, in this case, it's, uh, it, it's focused on, on, uh, on one or two examples, including the Zero Project. So you will have me here again in this panel, and we will uh, present our model on how to use artificial intelligence on the data that we have 
together with a, a project partner, which is Enable India. The fifth one is on women entrepreneurships uh, with disabilities. Uh, so we, we launch here and start here a new initiative focusing on, on women entrepreneurs with disabilities. I promise you it's going to be a strong session. There will be strong women uh, on the stage here and we really are, are hopeful that we are launching here something which will uh, start to build and increase uh, in, the, in the next years. And the final panel is focusing on, on vocational training, specifically on uh, international know-how con connected with, with, with Indian know-how on how to train people to efficiently and quickly get uh, jobs in the IT industry, not only in the IT industry, and it's not only on vocational training, uh, it's also on university education. So these are the six uh, panels that uh, will be here on stage one after the other. So stay tuned, bear with us, uh, and I'm handing over to uh, um, our kind moderator to introduce the first panel. Thank you. There was one session which I forgot to mention, and I, it's, it was a very fun-filled one. It was the uh, Bollywood actress Sayumi Kher, who is now so sensitized, not just because of the role which she did to disability as a whole, in conversation with our amazing lady, Sangeeta Mishra, who has muscular dystro dystrophy. It was a wonderful, very scintillating conversation, and it, it, it really left several people so sensitized to the cause of disability. So, over to you. Thank you, Meera, for getting us all up to speed, and Michael for grounding us uh, in the day ahead. One of our visions at CII IBDN has been to bring uh, stakeholders together on a common platform. And this partnership has helped us in translating the CII vision into reality. In these two days, we've had representation of over 300 organizations. Uh, 20 accessibility models have been exhibited. 60 plus sector leaders from uh, government, industry, and civil society from India and abroad have shared their ideas and thoughts with us here today. Uh, and so continuing with this magnificent journey, let us move on to the first panel discussion for the day. I would like to request uh, Ms. Ankita Shirodaria, who looks at portfolio and investment at Social Capital, to moderate the conversation on impact investing in India. Can we have you on stage, please? I would also like to invite our panelists for this conversation. Mr. Samir Garg. Senior Vice President and Group Head MNC Corporate Banking at Axis Bank, Mr. Neerat Bhatnagar, Partner Dalberg Advisors, Ms. Shilpa Kumar, Partner Umbiar Network India, and Ms. Anuradha Jain, Advisor Health Systems USAID. Over to you, Ankita. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for making the time and coming to listen to us this lovely Delhi morning. Um, I'm going to jump right in and set some context before I direct some questions to our panelists. So we all know that you know India has the largest population of people who experience long-term disability, and a lot of their assistive aids come from charitable organizations. Uh, we also know that 
uh, a lot of these estivades are not appropriate to their everyday usage and often end up getting abandoned. Uh, in order to become a little bit more inclusive, I think it's imperative that persons who experience disability are empowered to choose what they would like so that they are able to participate in everyday life, you know, independently. Uh, this also means that, you know, giving them not only just tools, but also creating an ecosystem around them, be it with health, insurance, etc., you know, that will enable them to live a little bit more freely. And we know that there are innovators in the country who are tirelessly innovating and creating products for people who experience disability, but are unable to sort of reach out to the right people at the right price point. That is this case of market failure that we are seeing, and we've been trying to address this for a long time. Uh, there is definitely a need for investment as well as, you know, grants, debt, various instruments that, uh, you know, almost sort of seed the ecosystem for people with disability as well as innovators to make the world a little bit more in inclusive. At today's panel, uh, we have panelists who have multiple years and multiple decades of experience uh, who by supporting organizations combat developmental challenges through grants, investments, strategic advisory, etc. So let's hear from them now. Um, maybe we'll start with Shilpa. If you could tell us a little bit about you know your approach towards investment for inclusion and how does say Umidya prioritize it? No. Thanks for that. Uh, when we kind of started our journey in India about a decade ago, uh, the hypothesis um, that we had, and it was actually Pierre's uh, kind of hypothesis, that technology and entrepreneurship can solve problems in dramatically different ways than we've seen in the past, and therefore problems that were long-standing problems, uh, you know, which we couldn't solve for many years. Uh, could be solved in very fresh and innovative ways. Uh, I think what we've seen over the last year is that hypothesis has played out. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I go back to what we say is our mission statement uh, at ONI, uh, our mission statement is really, uh, we, we say we invest in bold entrepreneurs who want to make life meaningful for every Indian, especially the next half billion. Now, to a lot of people, you know, it might seem like, okay, this is an extremely lofty vision, uh, but, but how do you execute such a, you know, lofty vision? And I think what the last 10 years has shown uh, is that if you choose people with the right vision, so when we say we invest in bold entrepreneurs, I think the fundamental premise is that we are not an operating org. This problem is too large for any investor to solve. What, what is really the essence of the whole thing is to find people with a very big and bold vision to want to change things. Yeah. And, and then to really trust that entrepreneur to do their thing. Uh, and I think as investors, it's sometimes hard to, you know, have uh, uh, this combination of like, you know, really finding the right entrepreneur and then trusting them uh, to execute. Yeah. That, that's the first part. But the second part, and I want to just, you know, spend two minutes on it, is that different sectors go through their own journey of evolution. And you talked about market models as the end goal, you know, that, I mean, if you think about it, and it was said yesterday as well, nobody wants to stay dependent on, uh, you know, uh, a grant or a, you know, subsidy. What every person, every org wants is to be sustainable, to be able to run their own destiny. And the second thing we've learned over this whole, you know, arc of our decade long journey is that when a sector is in its early stages, different kind of grants can help the journey move forward into a market model 
stage where market failure is not there. In fact, market success is there. Right. We've seen it play out in many sectors today. And I think just sitting here in this room, I feel like the moment for uh, disability to kind of move into that separate space of sustainable market models. I think we are on the verge and brink of that and uh, more about it later. I, I, I'd love to hear what others. This is really heartening to hear and I think I share that sentiment with you. I think we are seeing a lot of bold innovators. We're also seeing a lot of, uh, you know, support for innovators. I think it's the right time, uh, you know, to make that transition. So, Meera, if I can look at you now and, you know, you, you know, Access Bank is one of the leading corporates and you guys have not only done programs for, say, disability from a CSR lens, but also are trying to incorporate it in your business operations. It'd be really nice to hear a little bit more about that right now. So thanks, Ankita. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, now, at Access, I'm not going to talk about what our foundation, Access Foundation, which does in the CSR space, uh, how we are training uh, people with disability and skilling them uh, to different jobs. I'll be covering or be talking about and sharing the different aspects as to how uh, we look at it uh, on the business side. So uh, at Access Bank, uh, we truly believe that we need to contribute more towards building a more inclusive and a disabled uh, friendly society as well as in workplaces. So largely three areas uh, where we are uh, uh, making uh, investments uh, in terms of our people, where uh, we are just not uh, looking at them uh, as uh, a CSR activity, but uh, we are building a business case around uh, uh, people with disabilities. As we know, the number, uh, the, pop the population which we have is close to around, what, six, seven percent of people with disability in our country. And uh, if you really look at it, uh, we really need to build the business around uh, the disabled people as well. So what I mean to say here is not looking at uh, disability as a CSR uh, work, but are we bringing it into mainstream? Are we encouraging businesses to build the product processes, operations around the disability? And that can only happen when we have an inclusive works, a workforce where we have people who can think, create product, design products, and then also on the ground offer those product solutions as services to the set of customers we are looking at. Uh, second, in terms of the infrastructure, uh, of course, uh, it's an old thing when we used to talk about building ramps for people walking into branches with wheelchairs, right? But today, how many of us uh, able-bodied people also walk up to a physical branch infrastructure? Very few. Most of the transactions are being done, which are done digitally. Now, how equipped we are today uh, to cater needs of the uh, people with disability on the digital front, uh, be it about the transactions. And when I say, uh, Disabled friendly, we need to be mindful of people with uh, different uh, kind of disabilities, right? So is the banking infrastructure or the product services what we offer to our customers uh, taking care uh, the needs of the entire community? Can we touch more and more people? Can we start thinking around it? So at Access Bank, uh, we believe that we are doing at both the ends, uh, one in terms of the physical infrastructure, as well as the digital infrastructure. So that's another area. And third is about the workplaces, like we have large offices. Uh, we uh, have created an infrastructure where people can uh, use all the facilities freely in terms of not just creating a ramp, but probably uh, using uh, elevators where uh, there is, a, uh, they can uh, use the braille uh, to call the left. Now, uh, some of these basic things, what we feel that we need to work towards. And uh, of course, to uh, talk more about it towards community, we conduct sessions like pause for biases, 
uh, for internal employees where we feel that uh, this is a lot more this requires a lot more uh, sensitivity towards the banking workforce as well and uh, we are a hundred thousand people organization and we believe uh, a lot many of us are still uh, need to be told more about it be more sensitive uh, towards it beyond that uh, towards various corporates as well as parents of uh, uh, from uh, the community, we hold the workshops and sessions to sensitize them as to how to uh, deal uh, with the uh, social stigma or how a bank and organizations can support them. Thank you for that, Samir. I'm sure like more organizations will take your lead and you know work towards creating a more inclusive workspace as well as products. And Radha, if I can turn to you now, and I know that you know USAID looks at disability not in isolation, but you know, in very much with the universal health lens. So, if you could tell us uh, about your work in the short term as well as the medium long term as well. Sure, Ankita, and, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. And uh, I always feel an uh, odd one out between so many financial gurus and experts sitting as a health system person here. But uh, one thing we all need to understand is that inclusiveness is not equal to equity. That's the first uh, uh, thing I have learned. So if you're inclusive, that doesn't mean you're equitous. And with that mindset, uh, what we have ensured at USAID is that when we say inclusiveness we ensure we take steps that in, uh, you know enable a person to become part of the system and uh, one of the areas that we are currently focusing in the short term that we are doing is uh, there are several schemes of the government and disability is again not a homogeneous word that we all talk of there's physical disability and there is neurodevelopmental disabilities physical disabilities are still somewhat easier i would not call them easier though but they are somewhat easier to handle but you have to ask the caretaker of the people who suffer from neurodevelopmental disabilities how much do they have to learn themselves to take care of these people and uh, as part of that exercise the first thing we are doing is selecting the most vulnerable communities within those vulnerable communities people who have both neurodevelopment disability and physical disability trying to link them with social schemes of the government because the, that's the first step we can probably do and for that we have started a program called hug darshak hug darshak is an organization that has all 200 listed government schemes that they uh, link people with and the first and the foremost problem of linking is that people do not have adequate paperwork. So getting even the paperwork done and then linking people to it is the first uh, step towards this problem that we are solving. The second is that people have specific diseases, TB and disability. How do you handle? Do you have champions within the TV sector who can actually reach out to these people who are suffering from TV and are disabled, that they can understand their problems, their mindset, and then provide care to them? The third part of it is family care. So currently, we are working on family care just for TB patient. But going forward, we the, the idea of in USAID when we work is to create a platform. Once you create that platform, that mo model is tested out, you can build on anything upon it. And once we have worked with TB, we have our experience, we are planning to build upon the other areas and disability and geriatric care is one of them. How to provide family care for these two vulnerable groups. Last but not the least, the way we function is, uh, we also have a program in returnable grants that we work on and uh, these returnable grants uh, you know have their time period have their way in which people can return they don't have much interest but and uh, some of these grants have already been given out through one of our program and some of these grants are in process so prioritizing those people and giving them grants is one of the areas that we're looking at last but not the least is actually skilling the frontline workers and the staff at the primary care level 
of what disability is as the you know previous speaker said it's not about building ramps but it's actually that communication you do with people how honestly do you communicate with the families and the providers people don't even know that if you're having a child with cerebral palsy visiting you can you prescribe the way you give a drug to a normal child vis a vis this child with cerebral palsy the mother has to take different methodology to even feed the child even give drugs to the child so sensitizing the basic sensitization of the staff of how to deal with geriatric lgbtqi and people with disabilities the basic training that we need to give to these frontline workers and the primary health care staff which is the first touch point so these are some of the things in uh, currently that we are doing it's a long way to go we are not focusing on things like rbsk or creating a deic yet looking at paramedical forces that are required to sit in the deic honestly speaking we are not working this lot and lots need that needs to be done but i would rest my point here and maybe later i can answer questions thanks thank you so much and it's so nice to see that you know a program like returnable grants is also combined with capacity building so that there's that capacity to absorb the capital as well as you know transition better so that's really heartening to hear Meenat, if i can turn to you now and you know you've helped a lot of large corporates multilateral strategize their you know uh, programs and initiatives for inclusion uh, if you could tell us a little bit about what you've seen so far and what is the way forward thanks ankita i think the the way forward will become clear when we are clear about what the problem is right so and, and what we what a good end state would look like in my mind uh, over the last, so I've been a partner at Dahlberg and I've engaged with a lot of uh, uh, actors in the development ecosystem, advise them, but also about three, four years ago, I started the social venture called Belong, which focuses on inclusion of all different kinds. Uh, and I think the first, the end state we need to aspire to is a world in which the right mix of capital is allocated uh, to innovations that are needed for inclusion, for disability, but also for other kinds of inclusions. If that's the end state, then I think there are three things that we need to do to get there. The first, and I, uh, the first is to make the inclusion investment opportunity more legible, right? Uh, I, I think right now, if I would take two examples, um, uh, many of you probably heard of people like CK Prahlad. He coined, uh, he was one of the first people to coin this thing, uh, base of the pyramid, right? And that has really shaped the impact investment uh, opportunity and, and the market. So he made uh, the base of the pyramid market legible. He said that, look, there is money to be made there are effective business models to be uh, had uh, in, in this uh, with this segment of users. When I speak with people, I feel they they think about inclusion as a CSR activity, as a philanthropic activity only. They don't see this market as the business opportunity it might represent, right? So I think the first thing is to make it legible uh, to a lot of investors. And we have to use common vocabulary, very simple vocabulary to make it legible. And it's a very large market. Uh, the second is to dissolve the perceptual biases that exist in the investment community, which prevent them from making the, uh, they sometimes, uh, they make a lot of errors, right? So there's both type one and type two errors that happen in investment process. Sometimes things that deserve investment don't get invested in. And sometimes you invest, a lot of investors invest money in things that they should not be investing in with the instrument that they have. And they, uh, the, uh, their fingers get burned and they, then they are very reluctant to invest more in similar business models. So I, I think there's a bunch of, uh, myth busting that needs to happen uh, to point investors to the right kind of opportunity for their financing instruments. Um, uh, which brings me to the third point. This whole space of inclusive investments and um, is a very heterogeneous space, right? Uh, not all opportunities are the same and they require a very different mix of financing instruments, debt, uh, grants, equity, in all different flavors. So they, but the right mix, the right blend has to be deployed at the right place. And I think what we need to do is to really segment the market on two dimensions, right? Number one, what is the business opportunity? How much will the end user pay? Uh, or uh, it could be uh, like a uh, employer who pays for their employees who might have disabilities. Uh, so one is the uh, willingness to pay. Second is regulation. I think this space is deeply regulated, uh, this whole space of inclusion overall, but also disability inclusion. And I think if you sort of segment the market on how much regulation exists, yes or no, uh, whether there's uh, willingness to pay is this a is the viable business model then you come up with different kinds of approaches i think we need to learn a lot 
about where we are operating in and then formulate our strategies. And, and I think there's a lot of room for innovation in the creation of public goods. To take one example, uh, recently um, eBay, uh, they, their design team, they developed these uh, uh, design toolkit and they gave it, gave it away free to Canva. Canva design kind of too. And now Canva has embedded that into their process. Now, anyone who uses Canva, uh, oh, sorry, not, not Canva, what am I saying? eBay. Figma, Figma. So uh, eBay created that, uh, their design team created this, they gave it to Figma. Figma is the world's largest prototyping kind of uh, tool in the cloud. And now anyone who uses Fig, uh, Figma can actually create prototypes of web products of mobile apps that are inclusive, right? So I think there's a lot of really cool opportunities to create these public goods. Um, uh, but again, we have to be very nuanced in the way we approach these things because it's very easy to do the wrong thing and then uh, then retreat into your shell because your first investment did not work well. Absolutely agree. And I think we've all like somewhere in our roles also made these mistakes and learned from them. Absolutely. I hope uh, we as a panel are echoing some of the sentiments that are there in the audience today and are, you know, able to inspire some hope and reassurance that we are going in the right direction. Um, maybe if I can turn to Shilpa again and, you know, uh, just hear from you about a little more, more when you think about investing for inclusion, how do you articulate returns uh, for, you know, uh, for yourself as an organization, as well as other investors, as well as your portfolio companies? Yeah. So, uh, may, maybe if we can just uh, start off by addressing the point you made about bottom of the pyramid. And uh, again, going back, say, about 10 years. Uh, if you think about it, much of the market capital was going towards solving for what we call the first half billion. So inclusion was happening in an economic way only, and only those who had the economically maybe better were, were being served with products, services, and even livelihood options. I, I think what the last 10 years has done is, you know, inclusion has meant actually from a, uh, I would say, largely uh, economic space inclusion has progressed because what we call next half billion have been able to access some uh, a lot more choices actually everything has become more affordable accessible uh, having said that now uh, i would say capital is also seeking the next frontier and therefore the, the next frontier is really even currently communities that are underserved uh, but market in itself is a, a what would I say, somewhat you know sharp, um, a sharp category of uh, organizations when you look at market capital, and they therefore actually look for okay if market capital has to flow, uh, it also needs to the organization that they give it to has to be sustainable, has to be able to make that market work for for the equity they're putting in. And uh, now if you kind of, you know, say, okay, uh, if things like um, disability, even elder community, these are all now the, the next frontier in a sense, uh, I, I guess the question becomes, what shall we invest in now that will make this market opportunity become real? Uh, and our philosophy, just having seen it play out in other sectors is, that really investing very deeply in actually creating definitional, uh, you know, research at one level, uh, creating actually strong hubs of innovation at another level, just supporting early entrepreneurs becomes very meaningful. So that's like the first uh, aspect. But flipping it around and therefore when market capital comes in, what's the return that they're looking for? Uh, typically, uh, you know, there are different types of investors. Um, uh, but but I would like to talk about our own experience. Our own experience is if you define the market correctly and go into it, as market models evolve, you might see you know returns which kind of spread across the continuum. Uh, so you might have, when I say continuum, um, again for someone like ourselves, uh, not just financial returns matter, but what's the impact. So what's the impact return that also matters and we will in a sense not invest if there is no impact return now financial returns easily measurable our own uh, experience has been that returns can match what even uh, non-impact kind of deals yield uh, and we've also been able to not just show that return but been able to exit deals 
which kind of actually you know proves the point that there are other investors who will come in at appropriate time uh, to take these for profit uh, organizations to their logical conclusion so that's the financial return but impact return is really which is a little bit more critical and much harder to measure uh, and what we've tried to do is because you know if you just go the whole quantitative route you can get lost uh, so instead we kind of measure impact returns by thinking about what are the direct returns an organization can show and those are measurable so how many people do you reach how deeply do you influence their lives what is your inclusion score so these we kind of can measure but we also look at indirect impact and that can be you know questions like are you are you a new market model a brand new model and therefore you deserve the capital to try it out uh, or is it that your idea is so appealing that there are many other people who come in to try and imitate what you're doing or is it that what you're doing actually causes change in the ecosystem uh, on account of either policy change or some fundamental shift in the market narrative and uh, therefore like uh, what i'd really urge you know investors to think about is when we look at inclusion investing uh, it's not just about numbers it's about the beyond uh, and to be uh, very clear that okay it's not just quantitative measures but maybe a little bit uh, more thought on other measures which can give you an idea it's not perfect but which can give you an idea of what's going on um, let me pause here and maybe uh, anuradha if you could just jump in and you know uh, Shilpa spoke about the whole impact return bit and, you know, a lot of that is at the heart of, uh, you know, your design for initiatives as well. But we also understand that there is some kind of a gestation period before a community or a large bunch of people will experience the benefit of these uh, returns. So if you could tell us a, a little bit about, you know, what is that gestation period look like? what happens during that time and you know why is it worth it sure so i would say this is a very contextual kind of question it depends on what your model is so she very rightly pointed out shilpa that you know how you are intending to look at what you are getting out of a model so if it is an innovation model being tried out in a very small geography with a with a limited set of people I think you start looking at the changes very early. Uh, when I say early, maybe a gestation period of, I would call two years to three years, you would see some changes happening depending on how strict your indicators are and what you intend to take. If you want to take a reach, you can see the reach. If you want to uh, see you know, some kind of uh, changes happening in the system, you may see you know, as he said, ramp would be built or people would start talking about depending on how intense your efforts are. But when it comes to a large scale impact that you're talking about or a systems impact, as we call in our language, what we have seen in general a system impact takes five to 10 years minimum, because when you start, it starts with how the funds flow it starts with how capacity builds to absorb the funds and it starts with how the fund starts making that change in the system to happen so five to ten years any health system work and in this case with a lot of intensity it may go a little beyond but all this happens when an ecosystem exists so do you have that that's why i said you start with the context if you have the right ecosystem and you're doing the right impact or high impact intervention in a right place at a scale you may see changes in a phasic manner in five to ten years if it's a small geography impacts are seen and it also depends what you are looking at so these are the contextual factors you have to take in account to actually talk of impact thank you um, Maybe just before we move on to like a small call to action kind of a thing, if you would like to respond to them, uh, maybe or else, uh, Samir, if you could speak about like what would your call to action be to your fellow corporates, industry leaders who right now somewhere don't know where to start, 
uh, you know, to become more inclusive. Oh, thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think the first thing, uh, what I truly believe, and as an organizational philosophy also, we talk more and more about it uh, every day. The onus of inclusion is not on those who are not included, but is on those who are included. So we, we practice this, we talk about it across organizations in different forums, in different sessions what we do. And uh, for corporates also, I believe, that uh, that's the very first reasons why we should have beyond any business interest or a return uh, expectation. Of course, uh, those are important and required in terms of sustainability and uh, other things. But uh, some of the other good reasons why we should be looking at this particular space is uh, and how we should be looking at it is, uh, can we build a business case, as I also covered in my earlier point, uh, around uh, it? Uh, we may some of the businesses may think that uh, uh, it's not a kind of a business which could really impact the disabled like many businesses but uh, trust me till few years back we were not thinking how we consume some of the product and services today completely digitally right uh, can be done so i i believe that every business around it uh, can be can be built for people with disability. Now, what kind of an impact that will have, that would vary from a business to business, from a market size to market size, from an adoption. But again, can we uh, think of any any business where it would not be applicable? Probably, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, second, I think one of the advantages what we have realized and benefited is uh, uh, the PWDs uh, come with reasonably good skills and they have uh, really good uh, retention rates. This is not just uh, for the data point, but we have experienced it with kind of workforce what we have, not only in the access bank, but across the access group subsidiaries, what we have realized. Uh, somewhere, uh, I think corporates also need to step up in terms of creating a job roles, which are curated for PWDs. I think that's one area where we open a job role or okay we talk about and advertise about uh, it is uh, open to all uh, uh, the uh, population the entire population but again somewhere the roles are not curated enough uh, where we are attracting those applicant applications from the people of disability so if we think deeper if we are trying to build a business around it Trust me, there are there will be enough and more roles or people with disability you would require to extend uh, or to develop those product services. So uh, do create those kind of and roles. So I'll give you an example. At Access, we uh, of course I gave an example of ramps and all. So we did build up uh, ramps, but we also realized some of our branches are on the not on the ground floor. All hundred percent of our branches. So. How do we do we do we think about it or do we think about only availability? Some of the ramps which were built up, idly they should be at a uh, 20 degree elevation. Probably they were at 40, right? So are they really practically? I can't. Uh, I, I can get things done, but how are they being consumed or how effective they are, right? We can only evaluate that once we have people on the other side, which is why the hiring uh, of uh, PWDs become uh, more and more important. And last, not the least, uh, as what uh, was mentioned by my earlier panelists, that we need to create an ecosystem. We need to have the like-minded organizations in and around us collaborate, because uh, there would be a uh, uh, Im greater impact what we'll be making if we write, uh, if you are doing it all over, it, uh, all alone. And if you are partnering and collaborating with the many organizations and institutions which are there in the hall and, and on the, also on the panel, to work towards it. Thank you. I think I'm just going to end here and sum it up. Uh, thank you so much for taking out, uh, you know, time from your very busy schedules to come and talk to us today, uh, and your ex excellent input and continued support and commitment financially as well as time-wise towards this community. I know I am taking back a lot in a lot about articulating the problem right, understanding what impact to look for as an investor and as somebody who works with startups. 
I hope you've also taken something uh, that you know that will stay with you as you go through the day and as you go back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ankita, and to all the panelists uh, for helping us develop this nuanced understanding of impact and uh, focusing on context and ecosystem as we think both of solutions uh, and the impact that they are having. Thank you so much. Uh, I would have requested all the panelists to take their gift bags, but now we'll just hand them over to you as you take your seats. Uh, We'll move on to our next panel. And for that, I would like to invite our mo uh, moderator, Ms. Uh, Sunita Cherian, Chief Culture Officer and Senior Vice President, Human Resources Wipro, to lead us through a conversation on role of innovative technologies for job creation in the Indian market. Ms. Cherian, if we can have you on stage, please. I'd also like to invite all the other panelists um, Mr. Praveen Kumar, uh, Director, Global Network Security, Cloud Operations and Automation Applied Material. Ms. Shilpa Kapoor, CEO, Barrier Break. Mr. Ajit Narayanan, Staff Software Engineer, Google. And Ms. Meenu Bambhani, Vice President, State Street. Over to you, Sunil. Great, so a uh, warm welcome to all of you uh, on day two. Uh, I know that the day one has been really interesting. I've been hearing a lot of rave reviews about how you spent the day yesterday. And uh, I must say a big uh, thank you to CII for having put this together. I think uh, the fundamental intent of getting us all in this room is uh, obviously to try and use their network and try to ensure that uh, we make the best of the platforms that are available for all of us. So I think it is uh, our need more to question uh, and to ensure that we get what we want uh, from networks like these. Um, so today, you know, the topic is extremely uh, interesting. Uh, it's about how innovative technologies uh, can really help in terms of increasing that pool and, uh, you know, coming from Wipro, uh, which is all about technology, uh, and this intersection is what really excites me. And uh, which is the reason when, you know, Arman said there's a topic like this uh, in Delhi, uh, I, I, I didn't really uh, blink an eyelid, but just flew down from Bangalore to be amongst all of you to listen to our four panelists. I think they all come from extremely forward, organizations that have spent years in terms of developing the network and um, you know even before i go there uh, probably just a few uh, things on what wipro ourselves we've been doing in 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 this space uh, because it's not that you want to just increase the count it is just that you want to do the right things so that even if there is one person with a disability how do you ensure that the person really feels included. So with the 20 plus disabilities, with the eight geographies that they are present in, the idea is to ensure that both infrastructure, digital accessibility is prime. And of course, in terms of making access to a lot of the other features, which otherwise they would kind of miss out on. So without much ado, let me, uh, let me also um, 
introduce our panelists. I know you've just heard their names. Uh, maybe you can read more details about their profile, but uh, I'll just take a minute to call out the important lines that I thought uh, would be useful to talk about here today. So let me start with uh, Praveen. Uh, Praveen Sangappa, uh, 17 and a half years with uh, Applied Materials, a seasoned IT leader. Yes, I'm more fond of him because he's ex-Wipro too. Uh, he's got a rich background in diverse cultures, a track record of embracing cutting edge technologies and championing culture of inclusion focused on people with disability. Uh, we'll hear more from him because there's an interesting program that he started on people with disabilities, especially for the engineering graduates and how, uh, you know, there's 100% success of them uh, in the two batches that he's uh, taken into AMAD. So we'll hear more about that from you, Praveen. Um, then, of course, to my right is uh, Meenu Bambani from State Street. I was just meeting her after years and saying, you know, I still associate her with her fantastic work that she had done in emphasis. And I'm sure State Street is very lucky to have her. So two decades uh, of experience in the area of human development with a specialization in social policy. Uh, today, she heads corporate citizenship and global uh, inclusion, diversity and equity for State Street in APAC. And uh, of course, she was instrumental in addressing systematic challenges, systemic challenges to disability inclusion. Her early career was spent working with the World Bank and not profit sector on research and disability advocate, advocacy. Uh, to my left, I have Ajit from uh, Google, a uh, very, very interesting personality, having thrown everything in the US and come back to India to see how best he can work in this space of accessibility. And I think we need more Ajits to really, uh, you know, move the needle in this space. So thank you, Ajit, for uh, being on this panel. And of course, uh, Shilpi, uh, I think, needs no introduction. Uh, a serial entrepreneur with a passion for technology and disability, founder of Barrier Break, 247 Accessible Documents. I heard a lot about, uh, you know, the, the work that she's doing in this space systematically and not really looking at it from a CSR angle, but what exactly could we do in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, getting uh, this as a topic of conversation uh, in, in corporate. So, uh, you know, she's an Ashoka Fellow, a recipient of the NCPDP Shell Helen Keller Award 2008, uh, a, a model supporter for, of increased employment opportunities for people with disabilities, and the list goes on, but uh, thank you, Shilpi, for, for being here. So, like I said, you know, I, I, I do want to use uh, the 45 minutes that we have in terms of a meaningful dialogue. And I'll also try and see if we get some time at the end for questions from the audience as well. So let me start my first question, and uh, this will be to all the panelists. Um, over the last decade, technology solutions have grown by leaps. So do you think there are enough effective solutions that can offer a seamless workplace experience engagement for people with disabilities. And especially for the MNCs, uh, you know, we have on this table, AMAT, State Street, Google. I want to know, compared to your uh, country, other country offices, uh, how are we faring in India in terms of achieving this inclusive employment, especially for people with uh, disabilities? And of course, if you could throw some light on this would be useful. So Praveen, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you. Um, yes, it is uh, very interesting. Uh, I, we started this from last. I don't know. I don't know exact right time. I don't know what it is going on. Okay. I could not stop it, uh, but it is not mine. So, okay. So uh, we have been working on this, and specifically from last few years, it has been very interesting year how inclusion has changed. Specifically, uh, COVID also added some advantage to it in terms of working remotely, flexible working, bringing up a lot of other uh, technologies that enables people to uh, make a difference. 
uh, along with that adding uh, awareness within the organization building the culture of uh, inclusion more specifically for uh, uh, person with disability is a bigger thing that we have been practicing um, thanks to um, youth for jobs and other ngos with whom we work on making this enabling so i want to give an example of uh, how this has uh, the building awareness sessions in terms of uh, multiple areas there are video uh, uh, enabled uh, trainings or uh, there are act that has been done by people and there is a mock interviews how to conduct a mock interviews for the deaf and dumb how do we uh, work in differently there are a lot of learnings that brought us to bring it up and also historically a lot of our hiring has been focused uh, without uh, much of a difference in there but uh, with the recent changes or the uh, we included having uh, focused on campus recruitment focused on um, person with disabilities or, or even the employee referrals has a special bonus if somebody refers the internal or external employees for the po positions what we have and they will get a special bonus and we have this bonus but it is an added bonus for person with disabilities if some references comes in summing up all of this this has changed a lot and we are trying to bring up um, uh, more inclusiveness in the hiring process. Thanks, thanks, Praveen. Uh, Shilpi, if we can move to you. It's on. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think that the technology surely has shifted in the last 20 years from when I think Ajit, Minu, and I started, where technology was struggling till today. There is so much in this handheld phone of yours. There is so much already in your laptops or your desktops, which already exists that can make lives of people with disabilities. Uh, but on the other side, there is also the gap that not all the technology that you and I create is fully accessible, right? So uh, here's a simple example. So I run an organization uh, which has about 275 people. 65% of them are people with disabilities. Um, we went looking for an HRMS system, right? Now, all of my people use the best computers, use the best phones. They all have on Android, TalkBack, on iPhone, VoiceOver, on Windows, JAWS, or NVDA. They have all, and I'm right now only talking about the visually impaired at this moment. Um, they have everything. But the problem that I have as an organization is the HRMS software that I go and procure isn't always accessible, right? And I actually can't find one, no HR tool in India for the Indian market in a medium price point is accessible. Okay. Now that's where the challenge comes. So is technology advancing? 100%. Uh, but what we need is we need a handshake, right? Uh, it is an Alexa, which is, uh, you know, something my mother uses. And today she speaks to her Alexa and listens to music. When her device, you know, when a delivery comes, because I'm buying it on Amazon Prime, she's got this notification that says, your delivery is coming today. So before I know the delivery is coming, she knows the delivery is coming. Right? And that is truly inclusion. The gap is awareness uh, and implementation of so what I call base technology is Sunita. So for me, Android, iOS, Windows are base technologies. All of these companies are focusing on it. It is the technology that's being created by others, right? That's where the gap is. So in my head, I've separated these two. The base, we've got a very strong base today. You've got text to speech, you've got speech to text, you've got handwriting recognition, you've got word prediction. You have so much tech out there, and AI is only helping. But what we're missing is industry building for that inclusion. Very true. And in fact, you know, I was just sharing this with Shilpi before. Uh, I think the more as organizations we push back, like, and I, I completely empathize uh, on the HR platforms that uh, you know one is trying to procure. Uh, which could be 100% accessible. So I think it'll only happen when more and more organizations demand it. And, uh, you know, uh, the example I was sharing, for example, in Wipro, uh, the CIO knows that it's part of the basic check that he will have to do before procuring any new app. 
to the extent that I agree that maybe the big guys you will not be able to influence overnight. But uh, when you say no to them and you go to a hungry, smaller fellow who is willing to actually build it, of course, it might take a little more time. But I think the more organizations will move to such alternate solutions is when you know we, we truly bring in that change. So thanks for sharing that, Shelby. Ajit, uh, would love to hear your views. Yeah, thanks, Sunita. I, I, wanna, I want to maybe <clears throat> pick up from where Shilpi left off. Um, so two angles to this, which I'd love to share. One is that I think today Google is probably the world's largest provider of um, assistive technologies, right? Um, here in India, we have about 1 billion Android phones that are in use, and every Android phone comes with a pretty full range of assistive technologies. It comes with a screen reader, it comes with the ability to use it with switches, it comes with the ability to control it with voice. Um, you know, it comes with live transcribe and live captions for people with hearing disabilities. So as Shilpi said, in this one package that you can carry in your pocket, um, you have advanced assistive technologies that have taken, you know, decades to develop. And all of that is for no extra cost to users. Um, so I think it's a huge, it's a huge progress, right? Um, and it's not, it's not just Google, there are other people doing it as well at different scales. Um, but there was a, there was an interesting statistic that we discovered at Google. Um, you know, we ran a study at the beginning of this year, and we found something that really shook, you know, shook me, right? We found that in India, where Android has a 95% plus market share, only 1% of blind people are using the screen reader. Only 1% of blind people in India are using TalkBack, which is the screen reader which is present in Android. Now compare this to a country like the US, where the numbers were about 20-30% in a country where the market share of Android is substantially lower as well. So what's happening here? You know, what, what's the gap here? You know, do we have technology? Yes, we do. I think we've, we've made great strides in technology. But there's a gap in the last mile that I think we're still struggling to figure out how to fix. And there's a number of clues that you know, we have um, identified, and we're going to talk about it more during this panel. Training is definitely one thing, training and learning. But there's also this perception in India, and this is exactly what Shilpi was talking about, that even if your phone has a screen reader, the content that you're consuming with your phone is not going to be accessible. And there was this really interesting study that, uh, you know, a research paper which came out from Vidhi, um, I think earlier this year, where they took the top 10 apps that were used by Indians, and they checked how accessible they were. And they found this really interesting statistic, you know, it, it, it was also another one of these eye opening moments for me. Uh, by accident, more than anything else, five of these apps happened to be developed by international companies, right, like WhatsApp, and five of them were by Indian companies like Paytm, for example. And they actually found that the Indian companies need to do more to make their apps accessible than the international companies, even though they're all big companies with very successful um, you know, businesses. So there's, there's a gap here, right? And this leads to a perception that even if I learned this new technology, it's not going to help my life very much. So that's one of the battles that I think we're facing, and we all need to sort of combat together. So that's, that's our perspective. No, thanks for sharing that, Ajit. And I think uh, useful tips. In fact, I'm going back to the example that Shilpi said, you know, you have these fancy phones which you create where the technology probably exists, but how often is the awareness around it high, you know, and our example of actually going to the stores and teaching them, teaching the sales guys in terms of how you sell those features in the phone, because you never know who really has a need for it. Uh, Mino, your views on this. I think my co-panelists have already uh, shared my thoughts, but uh, from a user perspective, I can share and the change that I have seen in the last four years, uh, especially in terms of accessible technology. Um, I think COVID changed a lot of that. Uh, the reason being that everybody was online. And I remember when I had just joined this company, we were using WebEx, but there were no captions at all. Uh, so only those who needed it, then we had to buy those licenses for those particular users. 
then we switched to zoom and everybody had equal access because it was universally designed keeping all the users in mind then uh, we could not pin a particular video of the sign language interpreter in in the previous tool but with zoom we could do that uh, microsoft teams became the tool to communicate internally and that made the experience so seamless uh, increased productivity and um, and again it was universally designed keeping every user in mind but i think where the gap happens is and where shilpi uh, ajit have already quoted the research that we are not looking at the whole employee experience it's not just that the employee comes to office sits in front of the laptop and uses the tools that are there the employee also moves around the employee comes to the office in a cab because company is providing that uh, transportation now which tool are they using to schedule uh, pickups and drops they're using tools which have been made by indian uh, developers where there is no accessibility so users with disabilities have to rely on their sighted colleagues to read out to schedule to book uh, their pickups and drops everybody has cafeteria where they provide subsidized food now how do you make that experience seamless so you have uh, apps like hunger box etc everybody is using them again made by indian developers uh, site blind users just cannot use those apps because to even to order food they have to rely on their sighted colleagues to order food to make payments payments they can't make because they're using uh, paytm or uh, even the scanner on gpay is not accessible so how do you make that experience completely seamless uh, because it's not just that the employee comes to office and just does that there are so many other things and that curtails the socialization um, building networks and like arman was talking about growth how does growth happen if you are so confined so i think those are the challenges that i continue to experience um, and which need to be bridged true and i'm, and I'm glad that we're having these conversations here because uh, it just brings up the awareness of more folks uh, who will probably work on these as a next step because i remember years ago uh, it was probably 101 that we were trying to tackle uh, obviously the conversations have advanced uh, to to deliver these kind of experiences uh, which i'm sure will uh, will 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 bear fruit uh, sooner than later so shilpi I'm, I'm i just want the uh, the audience to also hear the story that you shared uh, and and especially having come from you know experienced what it is in the us to what you see in india uh, especially with respect to the solutions that you see so my question is uh, are they really achieving the scale you know especially for a country like india and how do you see the market shaping and how can this market develop more effectively okay that's a very tall question sunita i'm going to try and break it up if i can so i think the indian economy is surely poised for scale just it's our numbers right our numbers make us poised for scale um in the west what we find is uh, and ajit talked about this even in that finding where when they looked at two different sets of apps apps developed by indian entities and apps developed by international organizations i i wouldn't say those are perfect but those are better than what we're doing um so I think we've got a gap out here. The gap is we are a country which probably has the maximum number of developers, designers, tech you know, enthusiasts that exist, but we are not teaching them accessibility, right? Um, so I'm also the chair of uh, IAAP India, which is the International Accessibility Association, uh, Association of Accessibility Professionals. And our aim is that we want to see more tech organizations uh, learn accessibility, right? Because when they start to learn it, they start to implement it. Now, the bigger challenge that we have in India, Sunita, is that when I go to even the largest of, let's say, delivery companies, travel companies, um, you know, hiring portals, 
and I tell them, can you please make yourselves accessible? What they would do is generally add a single text field out there, uh, like in the case of some of the hiring firms and say, are you a person with a disability? Give me a tick mark, right? But that tick mark only is about disclosure. That is not about building inclusion. Okay? So the conversation has to actually come from people with disabilities being a target audience, which has buying power, which has money backing them, which needs jobs, uh, which, ne which wants to go and buy Netflix, right? Um, which, you know, so if I've got, I'll give a very simple example. I've got Netflix, which is accessible, right? I've got um, Amazon Prime, which is accessible. Uh, Disney Hotstar, not accessible. Geo cinema, not accessible. Right? Now, here we've got an interesting twist. Not only do we have the platforms accessible, we also have the content accessible. So now what do we need to do? I think we need uh, Arman, wherever you're sitting, as well as Mira Shanoi. Uh, we need a top down intent from CEOs right that they're here to make change so we have to stop from being a service driven company country to be a product creating country right and i think nobody can speak of that better than ajit because i remember avaz i remember the first time you demoed at TechShare, and i can never forget that um and i think that's what we need true and and i'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from you ajit next because you know this is the perspective from from what Shilpi said, but there's also a perspective from the organization side, right? So how do you integrate the perspective from the community, right? In, in terms of building the products and enabling the teams across the organization now, and how can one go about integrating accessibility into the policies itself, into the processes? So how do you, how do you get all this together, say, for example, in Google? Yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I think Google has twin responsibilities when it comes to this. One is we do need to serve the people that are using our platforms. And the second is that we need to make Google a great place to work for people that have disabilities. And so the answers are slightly different, but I'll try to cover maybe both of them. Um, the, the heart of it starts with this nothing about us without us, right? Um, you can't build something for people with disabilities without including people with disabilities very intimately in the process of design and development. And so within Google, one of the really key um, job families that's involved in product development is this family called UX research. And so UX researchers um, typically perform studies with users, they perform tests of you know, various prototypes of the product itself. But they also collect foundational knowledge about what the needs are for users and what the priorities are for users. And they bring that to product teams so that product teams are able to internalize some of those needs. But of late, we've been going to an even more ambitious model, which is called co-design. So co-design means that users actually have a seat at the table. When we're brainstorming, we're ideating, we're coming up with okay, what are the new features we can add to our screen reader? Or what are the new features we can add to voice access? We actually have people from the community that are sitting in those discussions and contributing ideas, brainstorming, and some of the best ideas really come from them. And they're also checking our assumptions, right? They're also calling us out when, you know, as people without disabilities, we're making, we're making stupid assumptions about what people with disabilities do need. So I think that's, that's one of the really important things, building the infrastructure for co-design and building a culture within the company of the ownership of these products and these features, not lying with the big tech companies, but really lying, you know, kind of shared between the users and the technology itself. I think the, the second half of this is um, what Google is doing to make Google a better place for people with disabilities. And, you know, we've, we've made great strides, right? We've won a number of awards in being um, an extremely welcoming organization for people with disabilities, but we have a long way to go. I have, you know, I have colleagues in my own team who are completely blind, who have hearing disabilities. And I think it starts with sort of a, almost a dictatorial mandate at the top, right? Which says, we are going to make 
our workplace accessible whatever there's there's no compromise on this there's there's you know there's not even an inch of wriggle room that we're going to allow here so if a particular tool is broken even for 10 employees it means a commitment to saying we're going to fix this it means you know if if we have to choose a vendor for a particular piece of software that we're buying even if the software that's accessible costs you know it costs more than the software that's not we say this is not an item that you know we're willing to compromise in our rfp right it means um, if 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 a person who's deaf is participating in a in a video conference in a meeting every single meeting we ensure that there's an interpreter available for that person if they want to communicate with a person with asl now i mean the elephant in the room is that this is expensive this and google has the financial ability to be able to make this commitment and live up to this commitment but i i think the commitment is the important thing you know to say Yes, this is important enough for me to make it a red line that, you know, I will not allow anyone in my company to cross. We will not make any part of our company inaccessible, right? And making that commitment, repeating it, reiterating it, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a way of phrasing it, which I heard recently, which really, uh, which, uh, which really caught my fancy. It said, uh, repetition doesn't dilute the prayer. You know, if inclusion is the prayer, we keep talking about it. We keep, you know, pushing about it. It's only going to make it more and more um, compelling for people to listen to us and obey. So that's 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 the perspective that I would bring. No, thanks for sharing that, Ajit. And I think uh, that's the only way you can move the conversation forward when organizations which have that financial power, and that's what I said in Wipro, that's exactly what we are saying today, that if this app that I want to buy is not accessible, or if this app that you want to create within, uh, you know, the internet, in the past, you know, every, the simple answer was go to our internet and you find everything. And if the internet is not accessible, then what are you pointing me to? So including revamping the entire internet to cater to these designs and until and unless organizations of this size and scale set the benchmarks for others to follow, I think it will not happen. So I'm really, really happy to hear about, uh, you know, what, what you're doing within Google for that. Uh, let me move on to this topic on hiring, because that's something that often gets all of us uh, anxious because one is you have the intent to hire but uh, finally people come back and say where are these people right you don't have folks with the right skill sets so praveen i'm keen to hear from you uh, especially around what you've done for the fresher hiring uh, of people with disability so if you could share some more on that sure thank you so coming from a high-tech industry of applied materials, our focus has been how we can hire person with disabilities and how do we bring them up to speed, right? So we have certain pro multiple programs, but one of them I probably want to share with all of you is called uh, Upskilling Program for Person with Disabilities. Uh, we started this, we are running the second batch of this program. The first batch we completed with 100% uh, employment across all the high tech industries. I want to thank uh, Miraji, I don't know if she's in the audience here. We partnered with Youth for Job and uh, we started this program. It's a very uniquely designed program. It's not a classroom training. But it is so the the if I have to break down this program into like we get a uh, engineers, um, person with disability engineers from across India with across uh, diversity at uh, gender diversity as well. And uh, they need not have to be like a cream of the schools because they get absorbed anyhow. But these are with uh, any anyone who has completed and has a, a plan for having career in IT industry or any high tech industries, right? Like we hired them train them so our training program is only 10 percent of it is a classroom training which includes the technology foundation that we build them the other uh, 20 percent is more on the uh, soft skill portion of it and again the soft skill is a very uniquely done because most of them come from the campus the college and then how do we adopt the program called campus to corporate that is run for all our fresher hiring and we do adopt it for um, uh, our person with disability as well. And this has been a huge success for them because I, I do get a feedback from uh, each one of them when they complete this program. And this is the eye opener in terms of their culture. How do they get into professional life and stuff? And rest of it is basically a lab and OJT on job training, 
right? So we map them with the buddy systems, like all the engineers have a buddies in terms of their day-to-day -day job, in terms of their career mentoring. A lot of the senior folks volunteer to come and support them as well. Uh, this has been a very interesting and uniquely. So when we, I shared this with multiple people in my network in other industries as well, there is a huge demand for engineers. At the end of each of this program, the engineers are completely ready to be absorbed by all this industry. And they are not going to be trainees anymore. They are going to get onto the job. So to give an example of some of these engineers who are completed in the first batch, they are working on all the latest technologies like a cloud transformation journey, which is a huge and high uh, skill demand in the market. They were seamlessly able to start their job from the day one of it. And including because in, they are some of them are even my team and I had put them also in the cloud transformation journey and they did amazing job and working in day and night to make sure that we are successful. So similarly in the mechanical and electrical engineering, the, the, the drawing, the models that they build have been amazingly uh, accepted, also appreciated by multiple projects that we have done. As we speak, we are doing the second batch of it. It is again spread across for mechanical, electrical, software and IT infrastructure division. Uh, second batch has about 20 engineers uh, who are undergoing the program. And I already see that a couple of them have been absorbed. Uh, I think they, they, they did on their own space based on the training. And there is a huge plan for them to be absorbed as well. So the, I feel this is a very unique program that we put together and has helped all of them uh, to get uh, ready for their career growth as well. No, this is wonderful. And, uh, you know, maybe this is something I'm going to copy because we do something in Wipro called train and hire but not from the campuses. You know, we do it more for our lateral folks who come in for specific projects that we take them for. But I think this is a brilliant one, Praveen, where I can probably expand it. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Uh, Minu, uh, I just love to hear in terms of, uh, you know, we hear about these ERGs around disability and uh, a lot of organizations have created those ERGs. So keen to hear from you, especially your take on the ERG versus CSR and how do we really marry the two? Because I think you have some really good thoughts around how we should not ignore the CSR piece completely uh, and, and how it just kind of adds to the business context. So would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, thanks, Sunita. So in my experience, um, I think it has been now almost 18 years. And I remember when I had started this journey, uh, it was with the intent of hiring and including people with disabilities in the workplace. And as I looked at uh, that piece in isolation, I realized that that's a wrong strategy because there are so many gaps in the ecosystem. And unless you bridge those gaps, unless you break the barriers in the outside world, the employee with disability who's going to come to your organization will come unprepared. So our education system, our, our transportation system, our infrastructure, our community spaces, um, none of them was prepared ever to include people with disabilities. So when people with disabilities were coming to the workplace, while the organization had created ERGs, it had created reasonable accommodation policies, it had created so many other things. Employees didn't know what to even ask for because they had never experienced it. And sometimes the requests for reasonable accommodations were like so bizarre that, okay, I have uh, low vision and I need a magnifier and that magnifier has to be like a 55 inch TV. Now, how can you provide a 55 inch TV um, in a cubicle? So I realized at that point that, you know, our colleges are not equipped. They are not providing any reasonable support to students with disabilities. So when students with disabilities are graduating and coming to the workplace, they don't know what to ask for. So they are struggling there. So that is where, you know, uh, I remember the first uh, initiative was way back in 2008-9 when we started Office of Disability Services at IIM Bangalore. 
and today that continues to have maximum number of students with disabilities because there is a structure available to support students with disabilities there. Uh, another problem that came was transport and accessible transport. How do people with disabilities come to the workplace? Of course, today you have much more flexibility. Organizations thought processes have also changed and flexibility is part of reasonable accommodation. Uh, but the mindset was that you are doing a favor to somebody if you are giving them flexibility uh, to work from home. So I think that attitude is slowly changing. Uh, thanks to that ERG, however, uh, because there is nothing about us without us. And I think COVID pushed everyone to change that thinking because they allowed just everyone that flexibility, which was always thought of as a, as a favor. Um, and I think that is more empowering. I think one very key important point that we keep missing in all these conversations is the role of policy and a very strong policy, a very strong mandate, which if not fulfilled, leads to penalization. I see that with 2% CSR mandate. If companies are not complying, they have to pay a fine. And since 2014 to now, the data is in front of us. Everybody is complying. And they don't want to be blacklisted. They don't want any bad name for themselves. Uh, and they have to give utilization certificates that they have utilized the money and they have spent that two percent otherwise the finance controller and his job is in trouble so what accountability is there if we are not fulfilling the mandates of rpwd act uh, if the government mandates that every website that comes up has to have accessibility i don't see uh, this market not growing I don't see a uh, full seamless experience for everybody with disability happening at the workplace and in, a, in and around us. Where one important point the ERGs bring in is the whole life experience, because what also happens is that we look only at disability at that one particular problem. We do not see the roles employees play. Uh, as people with disabilities, because they have multiple roles. It's not just they are people with disabilities. They are parents, they are siblings, they are grandparents, they have children with disabilities. They, uh, so, so there are very, various social roles. Uh, they need life experiences. They want to enjoy, they want to go outside, have a social life and all of that. And I think ERGs bring in that perspective when they are not just talking about barriers from one particular aspect, but they're talking about the whole employee life cycle experience in the workplace. Oh, thanks, thanks for summing it up, uh, Minu. And, uh, you know, I completely agree uh, on this 2% and the CSR bit. And as long as you don't bring CSR into the conversation with the business, because there I, I find it a little oozy goozy, but as long as that 2% that you would anyway be spending on your CSR efforts if, uh, could be channelized. So for example, what we do at Wipro is ensuring that we go to the grassroots. So children with disabilities where we start because the idea is how do you get more kids in schools to understand, relate and really grow. And that becomes our feeder pool. They may get into Wipro or they may get employability elsewhere and that's key. So there's no conversation which uh, can't have AI in it. So let me ask one question to you. Ajit around, um, you know, the fact that everyone's talking about AI and with the widening space of AI based models and solutions, how does the future look like, you know, especially in embracing disability inclusion and has any such models been applied at your workplace? Wow, that's a question where we could have an entire conference about, I think, uh, I, you know, I'll take the liberty of maybe wearing my engineer hat for just answering this question. Um, of course, everyone's familiar with uh, these large language models, as they're called, you know, uh, ChatGPT, Bard from Google. Um, and so these models have already been used today um, to help with things like writing an email or creating a document. So for people that have disabilities that might 
you know, limit their ability to have language, uh, to, to use language. These kinds of technologies are already helping. Actually, there's a direction that this particular, you know, AI is taking, which I'm super excited about from the perspective of accessibility. These large language models, etc., they operate on language, right? So language is the input, language is the output. An emerging area of technology is what's called screen AI. So this is AI that operates on user interfaces. So the user interface of your computer or the user interface of your phone is the input and the output is ways that you can control this. So imagine that you're teaching a computer, teaching an AI agent to be able to operate a device on somebody's behalf. Right? This is actually, I, I think uh, one of the, it's going to be one of the things that in my opinion is going to be a revolution in, in accessibility. Ultimately, if you think about it, the accessibility of software is not in the back end, right? The fact that you're using a database or the fact that you're using a certain protocol to communicate between your two servers, that's not the problem of accessibility. Accessibility is where the user interface comes in. What's the user seeing? What's the user doing? So the ability to build AI agents that are able to intermediate between the user and the UI I think can be truly revolutionary here. There's lots of possibilities. You know, I it, it is also a little scary, Sunita. I don't think uh, I, I don't want to push that under the carpet, right? We don't know what the future looks like, and things are happening so quickly now that I don't think regulation is able to keep up or uh, imagination is able to keep up. You know, with what what these technologies can do. But on the whole, I'm really bullish that this is going to be more of a positive than a negative for people with disabilities, and I'm excited about the future. Thank you. Sharbani, do we have uh, another? No, we're we are out of time. Five minutes. Maybe just one question from the audience, uh, if uh, any, uh, before we wrap up. Okay, the lady in the green suit, if you can just pass the mic to her. Or you can just stand up and say in the interest of time. Yeah. Okay, she's got a bad throat. Maybe you can just... Um, my question, um, I think Praveen rightly started with the importance of awareness. Now, um, there is, uh, I also pick up this line what Ajit said, uh, gap to reach till the last mile. I would say reaching till the last mile. Um, a child born in a family, uh, especially in marginalized community, uh, majority of them, you know, uh, are being uh, discriminated in the family, in the community, in the schools they go to, and then they reach 18 years, they come for a job, you do awareness, and uh, probably by that time it's too late. So my, um, you know, uh, uh, probably a, a kind of suggestion, I, where I come from is I work for an organization with children, we have, uh, we do therapy for these children, we have 150 of them, of which even today 30, children don't come for therapy because parents still have a societal taboo. So if corporates can tie up with the organizations that work in grassroots level, understand what is the kind of issues that they, I mean, if you come and show a video how successfully a person with disability is doing in your corporate, I'm sure those parents, at least, you know, three or four of them would be happy to bring the child, oh, my, my child can do. And they don't have that kind of opportunity. So I think if you can do that outreach to, you know, organization who work on grassroots level, I think this discussion or probably these, you know, can, can, can take, we can take it to the next level. We shouldn't be missing anyone uh, there. That's, that's what uh, I wanted to address. No, thank you. Good suggestion and uh, uh, food for thought for more corporates to invest in that. That gentleman there and we wrap it up huh? because I don't want to. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I, well, I must congratulate the panelists for this fantastic uh, session. My name is Rajiv Rathuri and I work for Saksham. We are an organization working with blind people. Uh, great to see Minu and Shilpi up there in the panel, old friends of the sector. And my question is not really a question, but I just want to take off where Rajit was speaking about. 1% people using TalkBack in India, Android phones. You couldn't be more true. 99% of people with disabilities, especially blind people, are using Android phones. 
uh, technology has changed lives of blind people in the last 10 years. There's so much I can do, which I couldn't do 10 years back. I can check the color of my shirt. I can check currency notes. I can navigate. I can do so much more. So we are working with IIT Delhi, where we are training blind people on assistive technology, sending them back to the states and positioning them as master trainers. The second level we are going down to is uh, at the district level, we are having trainings where we are identifying technology users who want to enhance their knowledge and training them further. And the third level that we're going down to is the Arthi level, which is the non-technology user. And we are reaching out to these people and telling them what technology can do, what Android devices can do for you, uh, what difference all these apps can make to your life. Uh, but when we go down to that last person in a remote village in Banoda Bazar district of Chhattisgarh and tell him, look, this is an Android phone. See, with the use of a Bluetooth keyboard, I can even use to, I can even use it to read and write in mainstream script. And the fellow doesn't have a device. So there is this huge gap, which is there. Uh, technology is advancing very, very rapidly. It's not reaching down to the rural masses. There is this huge issue of uh, unaffordability of devices and we're trying to bridge this gap so uh, uh, we've been supported by the tata steel foundation uns cap in bangkok is likely to be supporting us further we are likely to be moving to other disability groups as well and this network program is something that i think can really bring about a change we need support from corporates of course and uh, training the last person on the use of technology and making a difference to his life Thank you. Awesome. Ajit, Thanks. I'd like to be in touch with you at some point of time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for sharing. So this has been a great panel. So maybe I'll just end with one line on your vision for the future, Shilpi. A rapid fire types. Tech, 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 tech first, please. And inclusion included within that. Thanks, Shilpi. Ajit? I think technology that everyone uses. OK. Minu? Law that mandates everyone is included in technology. Awesome. Praveen? Awareness, awareness, awareness. Great. So I think you've got awesome nuggets. Maybe we'll just take it outside since there is really lack of time. Uh, thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. And thank you, Pandas. <laughs>
वो उसको चिल्ला रहा है बंदा बंदे कहा है ये भी तो देख लिया तुम ना
I'd request everyone to please grab their cups of tea and coffee and snacks and come to the main hall. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Keep you beside. We are joining in five minutes. Currently, yes, key break is going on. So maybe in five, seven minutes, we'll join. We'll start the panel discussion. Thank you. Your slides are with me, so well put. Or you wanted to know you at your side. The slides. I we can I'm hardly happy. hear you. No need to worry. Yes. We can hardly hear you. Martin is saying hello. Can I request all the delegates to please come back? Welcome back. Can I request everyone to please take their seats?
Our next panel focuses on how innovation labs are addressing the growing needs of India. To moderate the conversation, I would like to invite Mr. Shashank Avasti, co-founder Vishesh, on stage, please. I would also like to invite and welcome all our other panelists. Mr. Klaus Huckner, Managing Director, Access Austria. Mr. Michael Ramon, CEO, Access Israel. Mick, Mikhail, Mrs. Oh my God, I am so sorry. <laughs> I couldn't have gone. Uh, like I, I totally confused everything. Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Mr. Pratik Madhav, co-founder ATF Labs. Ms. Carola Rubia, Executive Director, Foundation Discumbrim. I'm now really scared <laughs> about mispronouncing a lot of things. Thank you for the thumbs up. Uh, Mr. P. V. Uh, Madhusudan Rao, Professor at IIT Delhi. Wonderful. And Ms. Lourdes uh, Marque, Director of Alliances and International Relations, uh, Foundation Unse, Spain, who are joining us virtually. Thank you so much, and over to you. Pratik, are you around somewhere? Mr. Pratik Madhav? He's joining. <laughs> Thank you. Almost. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Uh, this is the best place because lunch hasn't been served yet. And just as we're getting done, you'll know that it's time to go there. And we'll try and not hold you back uh, from that. Pratik joined us last, thank you. And like Mikhail said, the you know, sweetest best, sweetest last. last. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to talk um, about innovation labs addressing the growing needs of India. And if you're wondering why there are people that are not Indian who are here, you'll get a sense of that very, very soon. Uh, but I'll give you a little in um, that it, the solutions for India can be in any part of the world. Also, the solutions that get built and used in India can be used in another part of the world because our consumers are just the same. Um, I'm going to try and not speak too much because we have a very distinguished panel who's joining us today, and I'm really grateful. Um, I'm also missing two of our friends who are not able to join us in person, but I hope for the next year, and good afternoon, good morning to you, and we hope that you will join us in person uh, the next time around. What we've done is we are going to show you a little slide about the speaker, so it saves us some time from introductions. And we launch straight into questions. I'll take questions for our um, colleagues who are joining us online to begin with, and then um, go to our panelists who are here. Um, just a quick thing about the session. Uh, people with disabilities are, of course, the single biggest minority. They are the largest excluded consumer set anywhere in the world. They do not get served as people with disabilities, but they also do not get served with any other identity that they have. So for example, if you see the intersectionality for women with disabilities, they get served, they don't get served either as disabled or in conversations around women as well. The same in education, the same in entertainment, the same across everything. Not only are we not serving them, we are continuing to build solutions and services that exclude them and create new sets of barriers for them, EdTech being an example. 
So in EdTech, there was a lot of discussion around the barriers for people that don't have devices or access to the net to be able to use them. But what about people with disabilities? What about content that was getting created? And the challenges of EdTech becoming part of mainstream education, which then creates a barrier that's going to take forever to remove. So our belief as a panel is that incremental stuff ain't going to cut it. Right? And that's why you need innovations. Um, we've got colleagues that know it, do it firsthand and facilitate it. So I'm going to now um, go to them um, straight away. Uh, Ludis, I'm going to come to you first. And I have just one question to open with. What do you think is the purpose of innovation? And tell us a little bit about you know, the innovative in initiatives that you're involved with. So please make it a little first person for us. And what's yeah. the role that innovation is playing in the ONS Foundation's work that you're doing? And please start with a little introduction so our colleagues know a little bit about you and your work. Okay, so thank you so much to everyone. Uh, of course, Mr. Essel and all the team of uh, DSL Foundation, thank you so much once more. And all my colleagues from this session, it's a pleasure to share this this uh, moment with you all. Um, well, uh, it's a pleasure to, to participate in this event. I hope to, 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 be, to have the chance next year to be there. Uh, and, and well, first of all, I wanted to introduce not, not myself, the organization that I represent, that is ONCE Foundation. Well, ONCE is not the number because in Spain, uh, it's, in Spanish, it sounds like 11. But uh, ONCE is an acronym that uh, means National Organization of the Spanish Blind. So it was 85 years ago when a group of blind people uh, went to speak to, uh, with the government uh, and told them that they didn't want to uh, receive subsidies nor grants. So they wanted to add value to the society through uh, their work. So that's the moment that they um, achieved this agreement with the government uh, to manage the social and responsible lottery in Spain. That, that is a very traditional one and is the first financing source of our uh, organization. Uh, so uh, ONCE is the mother organization of the ONCE social group. Um, so they manage the social lottery, but they also replace the state in their mission of the social services for all the blind people uh, in, in Spain. So uh, this is our mother organization. And then we, we, we are a group of entities where uh, I, I'm part of the ONCE Foundation. The ONCE Foundation, we receive the 3% the of the benefits of this social lottery that we try to multiply thanks to the European social funds in order to achieve three, three main um, objectives, um, uh, three lines, three lines uh, of working uh, that are uh, training, employment, and accessibility. So um, then we have another branch, another executive area that is Illunion, that is a group of companies uh, with 50 lines of activities. Um, and all together, we are the ONCE social group, more of 7,000 people uh, working together to improve the quality of life of people with disabilities in Spain, but also with other partners in Europe and internationally. So um, why is innovation important for us? You can imagine uh, that innovation is a key element in our uh, organization because we have not only the mission to improve the quality of life of people with disabilities, we have the mission to be the resident, the reference and to help others to move and learn also from them, to move forward, to move forward the disability movement, to achieve um, solutions uh, for, for the needs of people with disabilities. So, Innovation for us is a key element of our organization in a transversal, global, and specific way. Innovation, we can say that is a key element of those who constantly face changes and challenges. 
And that is the, the, the case of people with disabilities and people who work for people with disabilities. Uh, not only because we live in a book world, but, but because the needs of people with disabilities are always changing. They depend not only on us, but also on our environment, which is increasingly faster and more complex. So therefore we are clear, we have clear that we have to anticipate, to be prepared for the future challenges and to be able to create the future we want uh, to live on. So, um, uh, and, and how we do it or, or how we try to do it. Uh, as I was mentioning, we try to do it through a global and internal approach. Um, we uh, think that innovation uh, and we want that innovation has to be part of our DNA as organization. So we have to invest in people. We have to invest in people because innovation has to be part of our internal culture. So we have to uh, constant uh, train the teams uh, to invest in studies, to invest in researchers, to invest in projections. And also uh, uh, we have to gather and play with other, with other partners that are, um, I think that really that partnership and to work with others is uh, um, uh, fundamental to improve uh, regarding innovation because you are always learning from others. And uh, so partners for us, uh, good uh, and expert partners are, are, are essential for us. So, um, and of course, people with disabilities has to be protagonist in all the steps of the processes regarding innovation and, of course, um, in our organization. Um, we, we have clear that uh, we don't want nothing for us without us. So the disability people have to be part of all the processes we try, we try to, 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 to implement. Um, so as I was mentioning uh, that we have three pillars, um, training, employment and accessibility. And in a, uh, so we try also to implement innovation in these three, in these three fields. And I wanted to explain with you uh, some, some examples, just, uh, uh, just uh, you to know. For example, in the field uh, of training and employment, we launched uh, two years and a half uh, ago, um, and, thanks, and thanks also to the European Social Funds, a digital talent program. A digital uh, talent program is a permanent training program in digital skill and technological professions for people with disabilities with, uh, that is focused on the acquisition of knowledge and technological and digital qualification uh, for people with disabilities to, prom to promote their labor inclusion in professions with high demand in the employment market. Thus, multiplying the professional perspectives of people uh, with disabilities. And main, uh, the main characteristics of this uh, program is that, uh, or are that, uh, uh, is an um, accessible training adapted to, uh, to the support needs of students. Uh, so they have a physical, cognitive, accessibility, technical aids, and personal support. Um, then uh, it's a program that is uh, implemented throughout the national territory, but also we are trying to spread this program at the European and international level. Uh, the training actions will include content such as digital marketing, e-commerce, web uh, programming, and mobile application, robotics, drones, cybersecurity, big data, artificial intelligence, video games, and so on. Um, and also, it has, um, it has an important issue that uh, was launched uh, this year, that is uh, the, that we launched the first digital talent headquarters here in Madrid, uh, which is a multipurpose space designed uh, around three pillars, universal accessibility, sustainability, and, te uh, and technological innovation, from where virtual and in-person training uh, are carried out. 
so a constant updating of the development of the labor market a new global and specific challenge is is is, is um is is essential for this program so we also are talking about partners and to learn from others but we really think that it's very important to be uh, um, to be innovating all the time uh, we created an, an advisory committee of, ex of experts from leading companies in the sector that um, that is uh, that they are going to support us um, on this on this um, on this program uh, to 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 identify the challenges and also to develop the solutions. Um, this is one of the main programs, the digital talent program. But we have also a lab, a hub uh, regarding uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, that is that we call it Spatia. Spatia is our lab, our hub that try to and is focused on the virtual uh, circle of accessibility, new technologies, and innovation. The three united uh, has uh, helped us to launch uh, more than 32 projects uh, to give solutions uh, for the needs of people with, uh, with disabilities. This hub is an open space dedicated to innovation and accessibility with the aim of further promoting design for all uh, people and for technology to become an opportunity to achieve the full inclusion of people with disabilities. This room hosts uh, work and co-creation workshops, not only with our professionals, but also with other companies that are interested in advancing in the design of products and services uh, that, that take into account the needs of people with disabilities. One of the uh, of these 32 projects is PACA. PACA is a is a is a robot. Uh, it's a project of the ONCE Foundation uh, joined with Illunium. And in Spanish, uh, in Spanish, uh, PACA means personal and accessible cognitive assistant. So PACA is 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 the first of the of a family of robots that uh, help us um, to support uh, people with disabilities so this robot has the ability to interact with people through voice text and images and offers information in an accessible way for the blind visually uh, and intellectually um, people with disabilities and also for uh, the elderly so um, is the perfect fellow and assistant uh, um, for for people with disabilities. Um, and then we have another important line that is it support entrepreneurship and startups to also promote and move forward innovation to give solution for people with disabilities. So we have also an acceleration program uh, that aims to accelerate projects, startups, and companies that seeks to improve the quality of life of people with disabilities with two main objectives. One is solve uh, the disability problems and two, uh, and the second one is to promote entrepreneurship, innovation and new technologies as transformative uh, levers. Uh, that this acceleration program is aimed to, to uh, two types of uh, projects that differ according to their degree of development. Uh, one is the projects that have already developed a minimum viable product or that are very close to uh, developing it uh, and that seek to, uh, to acquire um, the management capabilities that will help them to launch into the market. And the second is uh, our startups and companies with a product on the market that have specific challenges that can help boost their growth. So in this line, we have launched uh, or help or support to launch uh, uh, 17 social uh, projects. Some only two examples that is Muevo. Muevo is a project that, um, uh, that helps is focus on the mobility of persons uh, that uh, so use- I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you. Um, we are yeah. going to, it's a little short on time. I'd like to keep some time to ask 
for questions. Of course, so, of course, for sure. Let's go through the first round. Sorry about it. Don't that. worry at all. Yes, yes, yeah. But thank you so much. I think you're. No, no, a pleasure for us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Carol, I'm going to come to you very quickly. Um, I just want to see if we can have some time at the end for a round of questions as well. Um, and I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, innovation needs an entire ecosystem, right? So it needs legislation, perhaps it needs, you know, uh, various components and functional actors and stakeholders in the space, right? Would you like to talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, you know, there's of course going to be your profile on the uh, slide, so we don't have to worry about that. But take us through a little bit uh, of that in your perspective. Carola, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, I was uh, uh, take it out uh, so I can speak. Hello, everyone. Well, I'm so happy to see you all. Uh, I do apologize. I, I couldn't be in person. Uh, that was my main objective today. Um, congratulations for the Zero Prayer Conference in India. Um, as uh, you must mention, um, uh, share initiatives, and that's why I think it's, uh, it was very important for Fundación Descubreme to be uh, in this conference today because uh, through one of the largest uh, projects that we have uh, implemented, uh, it was an initiative from Enable India uh, that it was uh, implemented and executed in Chile. Fundación Descubreme, um, as you might, or probably just to share uh, what we do, um, we articulate public and private and civil society for the inclusion of people with disability, yeah? mainly with cognitive disability. We work very close uh, training uh, for employment and uh, we develop in conjunction with different institutions a strategic uh, initiative as the one uh, that we are involved, which is Zero Project for Latin America and the other large uh, program, which is Pacto de Productividad. Pacto Productividad is the one that I would like to share with you because uh, this is a program that uh, it was financed by the IDV Lab for three years in, conjunct in conjunction with Fundación Descubreme. Um, because uh, was looking for to transfer and to impact the uh, and to try to replicate innovative solutions uh, worldwide, and uh, also collaborate and articulate with the public and the private uh, and civil actors uh, for the inclusion of people with uh, any type of disability, because uh, it was important for the program to ensure the participation of people with disability in the in an open labor market under a standard of uh, quality. Um, it, it was uh, uh, because of Pacto Productividad uh, that we were um, able uh, to work in conjunction um, uh, with uh, another organization like us, like uh, that we uh, that we met through Zero Project was uh, Enable India. Uh, however, when we decide to run Pacto de Productia, and that's why very it's very important the question that you are making, uh, Shashan, is that in Chile um, we we were having um, published uh, inclusion law, the law 201015, <clears throat> sorry. And this law mandates both the private and public sector. All actors uh, are willing to participate and consult uh, council was created. It's an adjustment and ad adaptation uh, to the model uh, needed to be um, done, but with the agreement of all the actors that they were involved, um, based in the uh, program Pacto Productia, because this program was not uh, new in Chile. It was already done in Colombia, so we had some experience. The alliance in, in Pacto Productia were crucial uh, because of the purpose of, in, to promote the labor inclusion of people with disability in alliance with the Zero Project and support by the school and IDV Lab, as I mentioned before. And uh, because of this program, um, the ICT program was launched um, in which um, we have the chance to uh, develop uh, the program called uh, Bly May Project with Enable India. Due, it was designed and executed uh, with and for people with disability, visual impaired people. 
Enable India, identify the need of a self-learning tool for uh, visually impaired people, and in Chile, Fundación Luz embraced it. This is now reflected in a vir virtuous alliance uh, of high impact and great uh, projection. Uh, this is a clear example that Xiaxiang was mentioned to us at the beginning, mm -hmm. that uh, it is possible to have initiatives that were developed in India and they were executed in Chile. We do believe that a world without barriers um, is the way that we should be working. We are here because we are more than happy to continue doing this exercise. So if you would like to know more about us, please um, feel free to contact us at www.discoverment.cl or you can ask one of the people uh, attending to the Zero Product Conference to uh, our details. So um, it's um, our offer is open and we are very grateful uh, to share this initiative with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corolla. Much appreciated. And uh, I'm sure we can get details. That's the whole idea of uh, Zero Conference, right? Being able to interact. Um, Klaus, I'm coming to you straight away. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, what's a white man doing on a panel talking about innovation in India? <coughs> but more importantly, the other question is, you set up an incubator for 80s in Austria. Um, tell us a little bit about that. But you know, why should somebody from India think about participating and can they participate right is it is it only for people in europe or what just tell us a little bit about that okay thank you very much for having me here in this wonderful in this wonderful conference and i'm very i very appreciate to be here in india to talk about this uh, let me uh, paint the big the, the big picture and let me paint uh, let me say one thing that i say always in the when i'm between the lunch uh uh when I'm speaking, and I'm, I'm the one between the lunch uh, and you, yeah. Uh, let me kiss you. I will keep it short and simple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> why? Um, why? The first one. Why? Why is Why is a white man speaking in India about uh, the possibility in, uh, for Indian companies to come to to Europe? Because I think we have to really see the big picture. Yeah? We have the, the, the 1 billion, 1.3 billion people in the world which are disabled. Uh, most of them are living in the so-called, from the Western perspective, so-called low-income uh, low countries. Uh, <clears throat> thanks to uh, Zero Project and thanks to Access Israel, I had the opportunity uh, to get to know some other regions of the world uh, where I have seen that uh, there is so much innovation outside, and the innovation should be brought uh, to every to every person. Uh, if you come to if you come to Austria and if you join my uh, join my incubator, which is a very small one, uh, in Austria we have eight point five million people. Uh, three uh, in New Delhi, I think it's three times Austria. Yeah, okay, <laughs> but. Uh, there's the entry point to the European market, and the European market is one of the biggest markets that you have uh, in the world, uh, and one of the most powerful markets with uh, a purchasing power which is more than the United States of America. Um, I have seen that there are so many solutions outside uh, which are not affordable, and it must, it must be possible to find solutions in other countries, in other regions of the world uh, that are affordable, uh, not only uh, for these regions where they are invented, but also for Europe. Uh, so if you come to Europe, if you enter the European market, you can split, you can split your income because you can earn more money uh, in the European Union that you can use, for example, then in the other, in the so-called low, uh, low income regions uh, to also spread uh, your solutions, your ideas then. What we offer, uh, really shortly, what we offer is we, end, we offer you the entrance to the European market by helping you to settle down a legal construct uh, in the European Union. That means you have uh, a foot in the door for 27 uh, European countries then. Um, with the support of Vienna Business Agency, with the support of Zero Project, with the support uh, of uh, international consultants like David Baines that we have, for example, on board. Yeah? Uh, we have two now 
uh, that are on board. One is from Kenya, one is from India. Uh, the Indian one is uh, Planet Able from with, with Neha Aurora. Uh, we are searching uh, in the middle run for 10 companies to support. Yeah, uh, that's, the, that's the reason why I'm sitting here and I'm not sitting here in, in India. I'm sitting also in, in, in Africa, in Nairobi, for example. Uh, we are working together with a hub in Nairobi where we also try to find uh, companies to come to, uh, to, to to convince them to come to us, yeah. Because I think uh, now is the time. We have a new. It's the last last one. Okay, last sentence. Uh, last uh, phrase. Uh, we have a new upcoming law in the European Union, the European Accessibility Act, which has to come into force in the 20, on the twenty eighth of June two thousand twenty five, which, which enforces in a new way. Uh, the removement of barriers in the field of ICT. So, if you ha are interested, uh, give me give me a call. You find me on LinkedIn. Uh, also, the email address is on the on the I think on the slides. Uh, uh, and I'm here around till till the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. So, if you're an entrepreneur, the lunch is going to be around. But uh, catch hold of him uh, before that. Um, Professor Rao and Pratik, I definitely want to get your take on um, you know, this going after consumers. It's always nice to have consumers, but consumers who pay well are always even better. Um, so maybe that's something that we'll talk about. Um, I'm going to come to you, Mikhail, to first challenge you about Startup Nation. You and I need to talk about who really is from the Startup Nation. Is it Israel or is it India? But that we'll do after lunch. Um, so tell us. You know your take on an accessible startup nation is that element even there in israel is there something that we could learn is there something that we may have to offer um... first of all thank you thank you for uh, uh having me here um uh and i will uh besides what is written here in the slide i will introduce myself as the ceo of access israel and an ambassador for zero project uh, something I'm very proud of and believe in, uh, and that's why I'm extra happy uh, to be here in Zero Project India and feel the, 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 the wind of change, so uh, always happy to be part of this. Um, Israel, well, I won't argue with you, uh, but we at least consider ourselves and uh, we are known as a startup nation, let's not say the startup nation, a startup nation, um, and, uh, and I can tell you that um, we were not known as an accessible nation. Uh, when Access Israel was established 24 years ago, the word accessibility was not even in use, okay? So our first focus was on really uh, focusing on, on raising awareness to accessibility in general. Uh, we started with physical and with social and with uh, uh, services. And I think 20 years ago, we understood the importance of technology. The technology has to, to join the, the, the party. Um, uh, the way we started at first was really um, entrepreneurs came to us with ideas uh, to solve solutions that are, um, you know, right in front of their eyes. Uh, and we um, uh, advised them and, 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 and try to uh, uh, really give the input of uh, accessibility of people with disabilities, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I can tell you that um, um, as a startup nation, uh, Israel has a lot of uh, events and initiatives that encourage uh, startups to uh, evolve. Um, and out of all the initiatives that the, you know, the Ministry of Economy and uh, uh, the Authority for Innovations in Israel uh, and, and many more have developed, about 150 uh, innovations about startups about accessibility uh, have, ri have risen. Not all of them are surviving, but uh, we do see a very uh, nice uh, number of uh, uh, startups on accessibility that are uh, out there. And what we're trying to do as Access Israel is leverage and give those uh, startups the best, uh, uh, you know, jumping point uh, possible, uh, whether it's internally in Israel, in conferences we do, um, in, uh, you know, we have here uh, uh, Ruth, uh, one of our um, uh, leading uh, experts on accessibility that accompanies and advises and consults many organizations in Israel, companies in Israel, and brings the input of technology also to see how we can uh, uh, better services using technology. 
Um, and <clears throat> the idea is through conferences, through consulting, um, um, through um, uh, you know, brainstorming with the technologies, we are able to make them better and, and, and help them uh, uh, become you know, um, more uh, uh, fitting. And 10 years ago, I was exposed to Zero Project for the first time. And coming to Zero Project to learn, I understood that we as Access Israel and we as Israel also have a lot to share. And uh, one of the things that we have been doing in the last decade is take Israeli technologies um, that promote accessibility and bring them out there to the world, whether through Zero Project and uh, of course the, the great cooperation with Access uh, Austria and the Chamber of Commerce that are bringing uh, companies uh, to uh, uh, Austria to learn more and expose to, to new markets. Uh, I can tell you that through our uh, events, uh, we have uh, a lot of technologies coming from around the world to the Access Israel conference. Uh, and we are known, whoever saw us at Vienna or maybe even here, we are known as the crazy Israelis. So we don't just do regular conferences, uh, but like to add a little uh, spice, Indian spice, after the last uh, 36 hours of eating great food. Um, uh, so one of the events, for example, that we do with Google is the uh, speed dating, accessible technology speed dating, where you have dates of like eight to 10 minutes with technologies. And today the Statue of Liberty is uh, um, uh, made accessible with one of the technologies that was uh, um, uh, found there. So through conferences, through consulting, through special events, through international connections and using the network. And I think uh, um, uh, you ask Klaus what a white man is doing here in India. Well, the white woman over here is here because I'm a true believer that accessibility and disability is not local, it's global. And the more we join hands, the more we follow the zero project methodology of sharing, of learning from each other, of, of, of making one plus one equals 10, we'll get better results. And to end uh, what I have to say, um, the, 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 the side that we saw that needs improvement was that throughout the years, we have seen a lot of innovations come from problems that you see in front of your eyes. Okay, we see a problem, we find a solution. And sporadically, you know, there was not any method in this, uh, uh, in these uh, abundant of, of, of startups that started. Um, and one of the things that Access Israel uh, is doing and leading is one of our uh, flag projects called Possible, basically looking at the tech era and saying, guys, there's no second chance. Technology is surrounding us. It's popping up every single day. If we will wait for the second generation, the third generation of a technology uh, to add in the accessibility factor in it, we're too late. Uh, the gaps that have been um, um, made better throughout the years uh, through physical accessibility and social and, and service accessibility will widen again, and it will be very difficult to catch up. So possible, basically, comes and tells, um, uh, gives, gives the world, gives uh, um, uh, you know, technologies a look at where the gaps are in the future, in the near future, in the far future, and invites a methodological um, uh, approach of looking for solutions, technological solutions, for problems that we have now, but also problems that are around the corner. Um, and uh, the idea is accessibility by design. Uh, I can tell you that the first project that we are uh, focusing on is uh, automated uh, taxis. Um, uh, and and I, I will use this opportunity to invite each and every one in, in the audience and your uh, fellow uh, um, uh, um, members of organizations to join us. The first survey is about to be launched uh, at the beginning of next month. You want to join, you want to um, uh, add a look to the future and help us form uh, the future of, uh, of uh, automated uh, taxis, contact us. Shelly, raise your hand. You can contact me, contact Shelly, and really um, uh, come to us and, and, and give your email. We will send you the survey. The idea is to join hands to make a better technological future. Um, thank you. I think two important points. Uh, the first one is about future, not the very distant one. But there's a little message here that says that the soup is taking some time. So we have another five minutes to continue. Even if you ran for lunch, nothing's going to happen. Just to stay here. Um, thank you.
I, I just want to bring one little thing here that um, you know India has been doing some work. We have an Accessible India campaign, and uh, like you said, we don't have to worry about being the startup nation, the country or society or whatever. But I want to take time for some work that's not spoken of enough, which is by the CII, the Confederation of Indian Industries, and they have, um, and we are pleased to be their partners in getting a lot of businesses together, mainstream businesses, and I think they are here. So I must compliment um, both Zero Project and Mira in particular for swinging a partnership and getting them in this room, right? So um, I think that linkage is a very important part of the ecosystem that's getting built here. Which then brings me to the question for um, Professor Rao. Uh, sir, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about, you know, the ecosystem for AT in India is obviously challenging. You know, IITs have been doing this way before most of us even heard about it, thought about it, et cetera. And to sort of, you know, as we get close to the end of the session, I'd like you to help us take us through the journey from what's happening with where you are to then to where it can go to Pratik. And then finally, I think our exit is going to come from you know, the equivalent of an IBDN or whatever, right? Because yeah. that's when scale comes from. So I'd, I'd like to maybe just request yeah. you to start, sir, and then Pratik will come. Okay. 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 So uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, and I'm very happy to be a part of this great conference, uh, which is actually focusing on inclusive employment, a subject which is very close to our heart. So uh, we are in the space of uh, disability inclusion and assistive technology for 15 years. Uh, way back when we were looking at inclusive employment uh, and uh, we found that uh, inclusive education is a precursor to uh, inclusive employment uh, and we started looking at education more seriously inclusive education and soon we realized that an independent mobility is even more important for an inclusive education so that's how uh, we got into uh, I think developing assistive technology products for mobility and education, uh, which we have been doing it for 15 years. Uh, and, and I think when we look at uh, particularly the innovation labs, particularly coming from India, good news is that there are now a lot of things which are happening for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, from almost nothing to something uh, is the journey where we are. Uh, but I think there is still a lot to be done, uh, particularly when uh, when we look at more from the assistive technology perspective there are few challenges which still needs to be addressed uh, of course the three major challenges of uh, taking assistive technology to people is awareness affordability and access all three are extremely important and there are things which are happening but i think we are still miles to go uh, why i'm saying is looking at last 15 years of interaction with uh, lots of people and users of assistive technology, we only realized that India is sitting on a huge social capital, uh, which I think we haven't, who haven't got opportunities to contribute. So th there is a great opportunity provided uh, we are able to address some of the barriers for inclusive employment, uh, particularly in terms of assistive technology. And uh, we have also seen that there are particularly, though something is happening in tier one cities and some of the big corporates, but I think the moment you go to tier two and tier three cities, uh, still there are many challenges. Even there is a challenge of looking at people with disabilities. Uh, I think there's still the mindset is more from the charity rather than the empowerment point of view. I think, I think that's changing, but I think still has to uh, change. Uh, our provisioning system, particularly of uh, taking assistive technology to people is rather weak. And I think uh, we need a lot of innovation. But good news is there are a lot of startups which have come up and innovation labs which have come up in last 10 years in assistive technology. Uh, all of them are doing great job. Uh, I think uh, Social Alpha is here. Social Alpha has, I think they have evaluated few hundreds, probably about seven, 800 startups during last 10 years. Uh, just working in assistive technology. But the main challenges there, particularly for innovation labs as well as uh, these startups, is uh, I think when we look at the teams which are actually trying to develop, somewhere uh, not all aspects which are needed for an innovation and entrepreneurship are not being covered. Uh, 
somebody is very good technically, somebody is good medically, somebody is good in terms of business, and somebody is good in terms of social aspect, but uh, somebody who can integrate all the medical, technical, social, business aspects into one uh, is where there is a still a bottleneck. And I think, I think having a complete team uh, in an innovation lab and an entrepreneurial team uh, is still hurting. And I think uh, that is one thing uh, which we have to do. And lastly, when we look more from the user perspective, particularly uh, in the space of education, employment and uh, mobility, uh, the assistive technologies which are coming up, though they are adding a value, uh, but I think still what we see, I think there was a lot of discussion on digital technologies, mobile apps, etc. Uh, if you really look at those, uh, utility aspect is taken care very well, but I think what probably user want is more of usability, user experience and universality. I think these are the three aspects which are still not there. Like if I use a, a mobile app to book a taxi, it's a accessible practically in terms of theoretically, but it is not the same experience. So how do we bring that experience, uh, particularly in terms of both assistive technologies, particularly digital technologies is still a challenge. And I think we need to address, but good thing is uh, things have started happening and uh, we are very optimistic uh, for the coming decade that coming decade that many more things will happen. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to quickly come to you, Pratik, and you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, ATF, but I'm going to change that now. And I'd like you to, uh, you know, paint a little pathway for the work that Zero has been doing, right? And looking at all these grassroots innovations and then what's happening in IIT Delhi, right? The way I've looked at it is there's that, and then there's you, and then there's, you know, IBDN and its members, which is when we can say mainstreaming is happening. And you've Every time we meet, you surprise me because the number is becoming larger, your ambition is growing, and that's very energizing for me in person. But so, you know, I know we'd like to listen about ATF, but take us through this pathway, right? How, how does this happen? How do we get from here and what Zero is doing on the ground to where the mainstream guys start to take it? Sure. Uh, thank you, Shank, um, and thank you for inviting me over here. Um, it's great to learn uh, from all of you guys. I think the work which all of the panelists are my co-panelists are doing phenomenal i think they, they need a big round of applause from all of you guys with the experience they've shared uh, and i'll come to your point shashank let let me start with two good news uh, the first good news is between lunch and you it's me so if you pay attention i'll finish fast and we all get to talk for the lunch okay that's I was making a joke. Um, uh, the second good news, which I want to share with you folks is um, yesterday night at a global stage, Clinton Group Global Initiative CGI ATF, which is our organization, released a global report uh, on assistive technology innovation with uh, nine of our partners globally. And this is the first time world over at, at any stage. And I know Martin and uh, Michael and Mira are here. Uh, and I'd like to invite you guys to, to you know, join the, the group and definitely I'll share the report with you. But this is first time globally at any stage where you know, anybody is sharing that this effort has been supported by JP Morgan. And uh, we're happy to bring that knowledge, not about just the innovation happening in India, but globally to all of you guys and share, yeah? And that's something which is happening first time in the world. And I encourage you guys to read that report. You hopefully you'll get a lot of insights on, uh, you know, how assistive technology innovation is sharing, uh, you know, is really making a difference. Yeah. Uh, three points. And again, I'm going to cover your, uh, you know, question as well. Number one, when we talk of disability, it's a large problem to solve. Yeah. Uh, how many people with disabilities in the world? Can you give, give us a number? I know I'm just making a bold attempt to ask a lot of you guys who are expert uh, over here. How many people with disabilities in the world? Just put a number. How many people are in India? People with disabilities in India? Sorry? 20. Right. 
Great to have a big round of applause for her. Pooja, thank you. Anybody else? I think we read different. Sorry, please go ahead. I was hoping somebody would say it, but thank you. 100 million, okay, yeah. See, I think if you read different reports, you're talking about in the world over, we're saying 1.5 billion, somebody's 3.4 billion. If you use include, you know, I, I related diseases. In India, we're talking about somewhere 26 million to 80 million to 100 million. I think the answer is that we don't know the answers. We don't know exactly how many people with disabilities in the world and India, just one reason, and there are multiples of them, which I'm sure will come to your mind, is that we are only sometimes counting people with visible disabilities. We have not even gone ahead and found methods to count people in intellectual and cognitive impairment, right? But raise your hand if you think disability is a large problem to solve. Yes? I think some people are raising both hands, but that's okay as well. But how do you really solve this problem? A lot of time we take a view that I'm alone is enough, but that's not going to work, right? We need collaboration at a global level to solve that problem. Um, in India, we have taken a view that uh, uh, while we attempt to build methods and programs to solve the problem of people with disabilities, we have to collaborate. Uh, a lot of time we take a, all take a myopic view, but one big larger theme in it in India from last 10 years is the whole startup innovation, right? Um, can you guys guess how many startups exist today in, in, in India? And I know I'm not just pitching against Israel. Uh, how many startups, uh, registered startup in, in, in India? Can you imagine? There were 400 in 2012 and 14. 99 lakhs, okay, 99 lakh, thousand. Okay, yeah. So there are 85,000 startups. I live in Bangalore and there's a joke that if you throw a stone, it'll either fall on a dog or a startup founder, yeah? So there are so many of them in, in, in Bangalore. What I'm trying to say is we got to really join the bandwagon, the excitement of the larger theme, larger tech innovation happening in the country. And we can't treat assistive technology as one of those special, you know, niche section. If you talk about deep tech, it, a lot of work is happening and that's something which we can leverage in assistive technology too, right? That's point number one. Second, I think we, to earlier point which I was trying to raise, we need to invest more in terms of development in assistive technology in cognitive impairment. Uh, if you really take a, I mean, we work with 400, 500 startups in India uh, through our global network. We have 1,200 startups whom we have access to. And I can tell you if I put a heat map on the technology solving problem of visual impairment, speech and impairment, there are so many of them, but there are not enough work happening in the whole cognitive impairment. Yeah, and that's where I think Shishank, all three of us can partner together, do a lot of research and technology development, you know, to improve that area. And third, um, a lot of time when we talk to entrepreneurs, uh, uh, they, they come with a lot of passion and I think that's great. Uh, they have built amazing technologies, but what we are trying to solve is not a technology problem. Right? Uh, I think that's something which, which a lot of people said. Uh, we need to solve business model. How practically you're building a solution for somebody who can't pay for it. How are we going to solve that problem? How do you, 70% of people with disabilities in India live in rural areas. How are we going to solve the distribution problem? Yeah? And hence, I think we need not only the technology innovation, business model innovation, uh, which is where we're going to solve the larger ecosystem problems as well. And we are here to contribute uh, and I'm happy to bring all our global partners to Zero Conference next year and happy to collaborate uh, to see how we can uh, join combine forces to create that impact. But thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Pratik. You can open the doors. We can go for lunch. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm sorry I could have done a better job with uh, keeping time. Sorry about that. But hopefully you'll enjoy the food a little bit more. And all of our panelists are here. So please reach out to them. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you can pitch to him and to him. If you're an innovator, you can go to Sir. And you want to go to Israel, you know whom to talk to. Thank you so much. And Ludes and Carla, thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you, Shashank, and all the panelists.
I'm presuming hunger wasn't really a problem. Was it? No? I, I think you guys were hungry. We just like stuffed ourselves with samosas and all just before your panel. So we were good. But thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists, please? Uh, I'd request you to please take your little gift bags with you as you descend the stage. Uh, we will break for lunch now. It is a 45 minute break. We will reconvene here at 2 p.m. So please enjoy lunch and uh, see you soon. Thank you. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Welcome back. Can I request everyone to please take a seat? All right. We are delighted to present to you some solutions and collaborations which are being developed. Our next session brings to fore the DISH database for global cooperation on innovation and scaling. To take us through this conversation, I would like to invite Mr. Shoyamdev Mukherjee, Senior Manager, Enable India. I would also like to invite the other speakers onto the stage, please. Mr. Dipesh Sutaria, co-founder Enable India. Mr. Michael Fembeck, Zero Project Austria. Mr. Samir Raval, DISC. And Ms. Ankita Shirodaria, Social Alpha. Shoyamdev, over to you, please. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful and it's a privilege for me to have this wonderful panel with me. And having Zero Project in India is a privilege also because a place of innovation has to be recognized. And Zero Project is just exactly doing that all over the world. Thanks to Zero Project, thanks to Michael, thanks to Martin, and thanks to all the delegates that has come here from all across the world and all across India. I'd like to start off with a small bit of introduction with the panelist and to my immediate right, you can see that Samir is sitting. Samir is a coach to the startups and he is from DISC, Digital Impact Square, which is a not-for-profit extension of TCS Foundation. So DISC works with young innovators aspiring to become social innovators who has intent to solve a problem. That's Samir. A big hand for Samir. We have Mr. Michael Fembeck, the CEO of Zero Project. I think that's enough to introduce Michael. And I know Michael for the last three years and working with him directly had been a wonderful, wonderful experience. A big round of applause for Michael. Now I have Ankita from Social Alpha. She is working there and helping all the startups which has gone to the next level from DISC to the next level, handpicking those startups to give them the opportunity to scale and taking them to the new heights with the support and the funding. A big hand for Ankita. Let me introduce Mr. Dipesh Shutaria, the Chairman and Managing Director of Enable India. That's, I think, enough 
to introduce Deepesh. He has been a person who has brought in lots of new innovative ideas to Indian disability sector and Enable India is one of them. So a big round of applause for Deepesh. Today, I am going to introduce and give you a small bit of introduction on the topic. Uh, on the topic of disabilities, innovative solutions hub. So we can see that there are active solutions all over the world. Solutions are those which helps a person with disabilities to overcome any barrier. And we try to work in various forms to explore that opportunity. Disabilities Innovative Solutions Hub is a platform where people can discover, aggregate, and co-create assistive solutions and utilize them from all the spectrum of disability sector. And we are on this journey with zero project for last one and a half years to establish this particular system where people can come, see, and replicate. So this had been a journey. And with that, I would like to come to my first panelist, to Samir, and ask Samir, Samir, could you just tell the audience that how important it's, it's to have the solutions which are there to make it available and how important is to connect the gaps to kind of connect the loops so that the whole sector is benefited in a total manner. Sure. Um, thanks, Dan. Um, so good afternoon all. I hope you're all slightly awake. <laughs> um, because what we're going to talk now is something that has the potential to change the very landscape of assistive solutions, right? And um, I would just like to start with a kind of a small narrative, if we can have the... Um, so all of you would have at some point of time encountered barriers to information and knowledge, right? So if I were to ask you, do you know how to travel to Mumbai? And if you do not know how to go, it's a barrier. And that barrier prevents you from taking action. So this is exactly what we have understood and encountered in the last many years working in this sector, specifically in this sector. So everything starts with a seeker, right? So what is a seeker? A seeker is an individual who says, I have a problem. And I don't know how to solve it. I'm sure all of you would have encountered this in your life at any, some point of time. I have a problem and I don't know how to solve it. It becomes a significant challenge if you have an individual with disability in your, if you're a caregiver, of a person with disability or you yourself are an individual with disability. I have a problem, I don't know how to solve it. This is the journey. But while a large majority of the people stay at this helpless level, there are some who says, I will not accept this helplessness. I have an idea. So I have a problem, but I'm a problem solver. I have a homegrown jugad. And I'm sure I don't need to explain what a jugad is, right? It's a quick fix, quick fix solution that helps me. So I have this homegrown jugad for that. And I have a smiley face. 
because it's solving a problem. Maybe not perfectly, but it's solving a problem. So I have a jugar that works for me, but I don't know how to share it with others. So I'm altruistic. If it helps me, I'm sure it can help others as well, but I don't know how to share it. So again, I have a sad face. I have a jugad and I've shared it on the internet. People say, why don't you just post a blog or prepare a small video? And just post it on YouTube. You know, you never know. But as you know, with the internet, there's so much information and so much uncurated information. It becomes very difficult for you to figure out what is genuine and what is relevant and contextually useful to you. Right? So a lot of content, but not all of it is useful. Suddenly, some jugads become viral. I'm sure you all would have come across many of these. Some parent has identified a unique solution for the kid to know how to write. It becomes viral. So a lot of people start looking at it. But then say this jugad is not addressing the need. It's not usable. So while it may be useful for your specific problem, it doesn't address my problem. I have a slightly different problem. This is where an ideator stops saying, OK, I had an idea. I published it, some people are finding it useful, and I stopped there. But then you have the next level of intervention that's possible when an innovator, somebody who says, I will not be satisfied with just making this available for a small set of people. Can I make this available for a broader group of people who can benefit? So they are called innovators, right? So I have a usable prototype i a lot of people said it's not working i have identified what the problems are and i've created a prototype and now you know i'm handling multiple problems that an individual might be facing but the problem is my prototype is not scalable it is a some some kind of simple thing i've built but it's not scalable what will really work the magic is if this innovator becomes an entrepreneur what does an entrepreneur do they create a useful and scalable product. Okay, so now it has gone to a space where it is, and you can see some of those in the exhibition hall. You know, these are all startups that I've created. But the problem that an entrepreneur faces is that I don't know how to access the market. So I have all this amazing product. Hundreds of people have loved it, but there are millions out there who need it, but I don't know how to reach them. Each of these is a barrier of information and knowledge. So what happens is we have on one hand of this spectrum, a startup who has an amazing idea and a solution, scalable, affordable, all of that. On the other end, we have a seeker who is looking for that solution, but does not know that it exists. And it is unfortunate that this barrier, we all understand, but there's nothing that is helping us address this barrier, right? So what we, this is what we call as maturity of knowledge, right? So there are four types starting with data right so there is data data when you process it in a meaningful way becomes information information when you apply it becomes intelligence and on the basis of application when you start getting feedback it becomes insights and it is this maturity that needs to be brought into this sector it's in desperate need for something like this because at the end of the day if I don't know, it doesn't exist. So with that, I think I would hand it back to Den, because I think if we can reach this, we are going to get to a stage where millions of people who need these kind of interventions will actually benefit. And I think that's all we are here for, right? This call for collaboration, getting people together, breaking these barriers, and which is essentially what zero the word zero project, the word zero and zero project is zero barriers. And I think this is what we should all be aspiring towards. So that I think is, is what I feel is the need and what I feel we can achieve with a collaborative and, and of course technology is there to help us. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Samir. Thank you so much. It's a small insight that I got from this. That is that things I can't see things I can't hear, things I have not experienced, does not exist in the world. And that perspective would be the key to change by this particular platform. 
and interconnectivity is also something that we would develop with this platform. Now I would like to come to Ankita. Ankita, if you kind of shed some light on how important is user-centric research approach when you are trying to understand the value of a startup to be scaled up with your support? So when you say uh, user-centric startup, you know, I feel that user-centric is a very superfluous word. It, if it's not going to be useful, it's not needed, right? So of course, users are at the center of most startups we support. That is a prerequisite. However, we've also realized that uh, when startups innovate, they don't innovate in isolation and they don't thrive in isolation. Mostly you will see if there's somebody who's super talented will get to a prototype, post prototype stage and they might also end up raising a lot of grants. But you know, if finally, if you don't find paying users for the product. In some sense, even if it's a great product, it's not a great, uh, you know, it's, it's not a great company because you're not reaching out to the users. So the idea at Social Alpha is that can we support startups not only in their lab to market journey, but also at the adoption journey. And we fully recognize that people who innovate in this space have a larger lab to market journey do face significantly more uh, instances where they can fail or as we call valleys of death. Um, I don't expect uh, a product focused startup to scale like a consumer facing startup like Zomato. I feel we, we are all behind those comparisons, but I definitely feel that as an ecosystem, it is our um, it is our duty to sort of have that accept, expectation set straight and also enable the startups to travel this journey. Simple things like a lot of startups don't understand where to reach out to the users. They don't have a lot of funds earmarked for marketing. Uh, so we launched a small uh, market access fund in collaboration with Sidby, which gives the startup a small grant to subsidize their customer acquisition cost which actually consumer companies have a lot of money to do customer acquisition. In fact, like uh, VCs are very happy to, you know, give money for customer acquisition, but it's really sad that, you know, uh, when we look at impact focused companies, they really struggle to raise this money. Uh, in some sense, uh, I personally like to think of it as a trifecta of what we call the Samaj Sarkar Bazaar or the society, government and market. Can we bring them together to and create a conducive environment for a startup to go from being a startup to being like a much loved product of the users as well as then to bigger companies. And then can we create and invite a lot more innovation in this space so that the user not only has options to demand from, but is empowered enough to get a product more suitable and appropriate for their needs at the price point that they can afford. The whole journey is from going from a charitable mindset to empowering the users to demand for product and eventually make this space more market driven. I'm just gonna take a pause here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the journey has been to understand identify and co-create and there it comes i'll connect that part to michael michael the that uh, now keeping the international context in mind how important do you think that sharing of information between diverse group, like various countries, various continents, keeping the success of G20 in India in the context, 
where African continent has been integrated as the 21st member. How data sharing for the disability sector from the international perspective has become an essential aspect according to you? Uh, thank you, Dan, and also uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to everyone involved to be here and speak here to you today. Um, following up on your question, Dan, but also um, on your um, intervention, Samir, and then yours, Ankit, about data and information, um, I start with giving you two types of information. One is the, the general issue on, on, on data as we see it from the Zero Project perspective, and also what we are currently working on as a, as a solution to that. So, um, as you heard now in the course of this conference several times, the Zero Project is a global project. It involves all sectors of society and it's all driven by finding and sharing and communicating innovative solutions. And we have in the course of this, in the past 12 years, collected an enormous amount of data that comes with that. So, uh, this is all an ecosystem project, people from the community, from all sectors, from UNICEF to governments, to Google, to grassroots organization, all of them nominate nominations and nominate good solutions, what they think should get an award. And other members of this community give us their grades, give us their comments, give us their review. Um, and this is then all aggregated in the selection. So we have the nomination data from now, I think more than 4,000 projects from 150 countries in the past 10 years. And then from those that have been awarded, which also come up to 900 from, I think, 120 countries or so, we have much more than that. We have the description, we have fact sheets, but we also have their presentations in videos at the Zero Project Conference. We have their PowerPoint presentations, we have the pictures. Uh, so there's a lot that comes with it that we have as data. On the other hand, what type of data is that? No? Um, and in, at, this mo at this stage, until this year, it was really hard to make this usable to a community. We do this by organizing a large conference, by coming here and sharing what we learned also here. Uh, and we have a website where you can filter information and we have a report. Uh, but there was not a lot uh, that can could be directly used. And uh, Samir and Ankita, you managed already some target groups of this. Um, so a government could not really use what we are doing unless they did some drilling and research on their own, but it was really hard work for them. So, so far it was more art for the art uh, and uh, some people used it, most people did not use it. And then here this year, it came, artificial intelligence came and these language driven models came and this generative artificial intelligence came and this proved immediately as we understood the potential to be a large game changer for us. So this immediately reduced uh, all the, not, not, it's not zero barriers, but barriers to this type of information has been dramatically reduced and we are starting to build new projects um, related to that. And what you see on the, on the screen is, is our approach to that. You don't have to go into many details, but this is the, the chart that we are working from. So in the, in the top right corner, uh, this is the zero budget database. We are building this, we are working on this. So this is what we own and this is our own data. We are, will build a kind of platform that, that is built in a way that all the data that we have can be shared with partners and can be used uh, based on, on, on these new artificial intelligence tools. And using this, we will build different um, tools, different apps, different portals, whatever you call this. Huh? For, to give you an, an idea also what I'm talking about, um, a government needs very different types of information if they want to implement our and work with our data. They are not interested in startup innovations. They are not interested in pilots. They're interested in models that work. Uh, an investor like Social Alpha, they need a very different type of information. They need information related to scaling potentials, to the stage where they are, they need fundamentals and so on. So with these new tools, and there are a lot of other groups, some, someone working on the ground who is a person with disability, they need again very different information. They want to know, is this available? Is this affordable? Where can I buy it? So these are very different types of group of users that so far could not use what we offer. 
And the models that we're working on, and this is my, then my full circle, is with these new artificial intelligence-based tools, um, we, made, we make this available together with partners. So one project that we're working on already, and we have gotten just recently a grant from Microsoft on this, is uh, building a kind of expert system for governments to improve the regulations on accessibility uh, and inclusion. So if there's a government, let's say, let's say India, let's say country X, uh, and that there's a government official working on that, uh, he's, he can say, well, this is a current regulation, copy paste the current regulation on, let's say, web accessibility, give me some examples from, from other countries, he will get this from the zero budget database. So this, this is how this is going to work. And together with, uh, with Enable India and with the DISH project, we are also working on two models, which I'm not diving into. I think this is then up to the second stage. So thank you, and I'm stopping here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. It's all about collect, collate, and disseminate the information and solutions that you have. And that is so important to interchange information with all and every stakeholders. So coming from collect, collate, and disseminate, I'd like to go to the next step is to having the economic context. So going to Dipesh, I'd like to Dipesh, just uh, if you can enlighten us on the uh, this common search mechanism. How can this common search mechanism uh, help the huge unexplored economic opportunity that the sector has in a broader way? Thank you, Dan. By the way, you're doing a good job. So, um, I think first of all, let me start by signing. So my sign name is Deepesh, D with a golf. So I love golf. So that's what my sign name is for our deaf friends. And uh, I'm wearing a blue shirt, a green jacket and a khaki pant for my visually impaired friends. Um, I think when we talk about economy, how many of you in this room have are wearing spectacles, glasses? Raise your hands. Yeah, me too. So in the 13th century, there was somebody who um, invented um, glasses, assistive solution, no? So they took two convex lenses, put it in a wooden frame and um, say, oh, I can see something better now. So this person suddenly didn't become visually impaired. There is an assistive solution. But what happened basically till the 19th century, this was always like only the rich can afford and nobody could afford the glasses or spectacles. And what was it basically? Again, like today's scenario, if you see, that is what is happening. We are seeing that we invented something that somebody cannot afford. How do I get there? But then somebody entrepreneurship happened. It became a business. It became an economy. And today it is a $169 billion economy. And that is what basically is the economy we need to look at or tap into. Why can't we learn? Otherwise I would be visually impaired and yeah, who are very inspiring, you are visually impaired, all that happens. But I think today we look at all um, brand glasses and various things. So sometimes my vision was, and I keep thinking to myself, why does the white cane have to be white? It's because of the contrast, but can I opt for a very glossy looking cane, different canes, I want a very dashing looking cane and walk with it. Why can't we think of that? I think we are stuck to say that, okay, the cane has to be white. So now I can opt for, and I, I'd love to pay more for that. So these are, I think so many various things happen. And that is what I basically said that, can we look at the whole uh, mindset to be changed, to be demand driven. And I think we keep saying, and a lot of this, I think I heard this conference that so many experiences, so many things happening, how do we change? Or what are, what are the next steps? How do I find market um, linkages and those things? So I think if you look at this whole demand side, and here is one uh, demand curve. I'm not an economist, but one of the professors who's on our advisory board from INSEAD is a professor in political economics. And uh, this is where the graph came up saying that, what is the challenge when you look at economy, the price and the quantity, the demand curve 
is actually going from up to down. So when the quantity increases, the price goes down. Very clearly, I think all of us know. And the supply actually curve goes from down to up. And as you can see from the screen, it's such wide in our field that the de demand and the supply curve doesn't meet, right? You see that whole uh, idea that the demand is waiting, where is the solution? Uh, oh, I, I want this solution, but I don't get it. Or I have a solution, I'm not finding users for it. So it's such a huge gap on demand and supply. And that is the reason which we are struggling today. This, uh, what are we finding the difficulties? Actually, in certain cases, the supply curve is only a dot because the supply doesn't even exist. And that is where the situation is today saying that this is the whole economy side. How do I bring the demand and supply together? And uh, this is where basically if you look at and the, one of the ways to do is bringing using technology. And many of us know, I think that um, India, the biggest success story was the whole Aadhaar. ID. And if you know that uh, Aadhaar was the fastest billion people transactions which were done beyond Facebooks and anything which was there within six years, we got billion people Aadhaar ID. And that was only possible because of digital infrastructure or digitization. And the transaction costs started coming up. We started seeing the UPI, the unified payment interface happening and so many things basically getting uh, easy now the what is happening with that the transaction cost is going down so as the transaction cost goes down your uh, quantity and all that goes keeps increasing and all that so the idea is can we use uh, this whole digital infrastructure power to scale so there are two things which we need to do one is uh, discoverability and the second one is interoperability interoperability Discoverability is what I think we, many of you are part of the project discovery, saying that I want to discover solutions from the grassroots. So many people, I think we saw the power where within a short time today, I think we are talking then 4,000 plus grassroots solutions which are coming. And I love to say this uh, story because it's so touching, uh, um, a grassroots solution where there was a boy in the interiors of West Bengal could not catch a pencil and was not able to write. And this lovely NGO, basically what they did was they used a solution, simple solution, took a potato, put his put in his hand, put the pencil inside the potato and he was able to write. So that was a solution. What is the solution of potato? Now they did even fantastic. They actually started peeling the potato and putting in the sun. So it became harder, harder, harder. That became a therapy and today he's able to write. That's such a simple, wonderful solution. Now, if there is a, somebody who is not able to write, I have a daughter who is not uh, able to write or catch a pencil. Imagine there was a system which is discoverable. I just type and say, okay, my daughter is not able to catch a pencil. Here is a solution, potato, <laughs> just use that. So this is the whole power of how we can make it discoverable. So we are kind of looking at creating a platform to um, so that is this basically saying that how that whole solutions can be discoverable. And now we can see the power saying that how do I become interoperable? If somebody has a solution, can that become a market and all that? And I give one um, example, which is very, very powerful. And many of you probably know the whole uh, ONDC, which is Open Networks Digital Commerce, which is a very big thing in the country and now world, where in G20, I think they signed uh, that hash DPI will be the future for the world. And hash DPI is digital public infrastructure. And uh, imagine if we can use the power of digital infrastructure for disability, I think it's going to change a lot of things. And one of the examples of what we did was, uh, there is a very simple example for, called Namma Yatri in Bangalore. And Namma Yatri is an uh, auto rickshaw app for um, like Uber. So you, you take Uber and order a, a, a ride for you. So that way, Namayatri is a ride. That is built on open network. What happened was basically with that open network, they, they reduced the transaction cost from 100 rupees to four rupees. You can imagine the transaction cost when it comes from 100 to four. Suddenly, Namayatri within the last four months has 
taken over the market in Bangalore. 30% of the users are using Namayatri. The drivers are getting most of the profits and Namayatri has already reached the maximum of 1 lakh rides per day. That is the power of digital is what basically is, is important. Now, how do you kind of look at that? So how do we use that? So one of the things we did was we actually told Amayatri make it purple aware. Purple, I think all of us connect purple with disability sector. I see a lot of people in purple as well, which is nice. But if thing, if you look at, if make it purple aware. So what we did was actually it created a input in saying that I am a person who's blind and I am going to book a ride. So when you book a ride, the driver will know that um, this person is blind and will need help. And a small 30 second video comes up where the person will, um, uh, the driver will know how to behave with a person who's blind. And not only that, they get a purple badge. Saying that you got a badge. And when they get purple batches and they collect, they actually start um, uh, getting more incentives. So you can see how I'm just giving a picture of how uh, things can change by just demand and all that. So I think that is what the whole core is. So what are we, what we need to do is, uh, Michael, just uh, next. So I think what I'm telling is the thing is we need to make the demand and the supply come together. And how do we make that come together uh, is by probably integrating to the mainstream like Namayatris or creating a platform like DISH, which is the Disability Innovative Solutions Hub, where we are unifying solutions. And I'm saying unifying, not uniting, because uniting is different. Unifying is each one will get their data, but I'm just going to be able to be discoverable. That is what we are doing with Zero Project. Zero Project data is with Zero Project. Project discovery data is somewhere. Anybody else has data. I think everybody just owns their data, but I think it becomes discoverable so that we can actually search for a solution for a problem. So that is the, I know then I've been long, but I think it was important for the economic end. So thank you, Dipesh. Uh, digital public infra infrastructure is our next biggest thing that's coming up in India and in the world also. So uh, that is something that we uh, kind of can understand. Uh, I would now I would like to go to the next level uh, of our discussion. And this next level, I'm going to request the panelists to have uh, three minutes each. And I'm going to spread out the one common question for first two panelists, that is Samir and Ankita. And second question would be for Michael and Dipesh. So, uh, Ankita and Samir, can I uh, just to ask you that when you work in the context of disability, what is the key element that you miss that can be integrated in this platform, which would help the development of the work base that you do? Okay, so I think we spoke about data information intelligence. Um, so there is a, the way I look at it, what we, what we do at Digital Impact Square is we work with very early stage, very early stage. I mean, it's, it's not even a seed of an idea. But what is even more important is, are you solving the right problem? So the common thing is if you have a wrong question, all your answers are wrong, right? So the single biggest factor for an idea to succeed is that idea should be solving a problem worth solving. If it's too trivial, you won't find many users. If it's too complex, if it is misunderstood, not properly understood, you will not get any adoption. So I think it is very important that ideators, innovators, startups, you know, we, we talk about technology and all of those things. Every successful startup started with a problem that was worth solving and that was strongly felt in the ecosystem. If we can, through this platform, help 
ideators, innovators. I think a lot of people struggle because they don't know what problem to solve. I have all these amazing, I'm, a, I'm from IIT and I have all these excellent, amazing technical skills. You've seen this in action at Digital Impact Square. You take somebody who's really, really passionate and understands technology or whatever it is. If you give them the right problem to solve, magic happens. So if through this platform, we are able to co-curate problems worth solving. How do we co-curate? How do we co-create or co-curate? By listening to what people are looking for. I am an individual struggling with X. And if there are thousands of people who are posting the same challenge, we understand it's a problem worth solving. Not what if I could take that problem worth solving and launch it as a challenge or whatever you can call it, and then get people with the, with the know-how, technology, or entrepreneurial mindset to pick it up and then create a sustainable, potentially sustainable startup. I think if we can manage this, um, it, can, it can really change the dynamics of how startups are evolving in, in our setup. Because whether we like it or not, disability sector, or the challenges faced by the sector is not a high priority for the youth of our country. Because the young people are looking for excitement, they want sustainability, profitability, none of that is bad. So we should try and bridge that gap through this information that we can provide them. Give them a problem worth solving and when, you, and when enough people start working on it, you will see some interesting ideas and hopefully sustainable startups emerge out of that. Yes, please, thank you. Just adding on to what Samir said, uh, I think from what I've seen in the past couple of years is a lot of startups in this space, in this space face similar issues, right? And one of the biggest issues is that they get very little feedback in their post prototype stage from users. And uh, you will see a lot of success stories are glorified, are celebrated, and they should be. But at the same time, sometimes products which are very small could work only for a small section of people. To say that because we have these three products in this category, let's not be under the impression that, uh, you know, that need is solved or that gap is closed. So I think if the platform can provide a, a little bit of space uh, for sort of unfiltered feedback from users on innovations as well as problems uh, with simple things like canes, wheelchairs, products that have been here for a while. So, I mean, because if somebody like, say, Dextroware wants to work, uh, wants to integrate their product in a wheelchair, they exactly know what they should, they, they should work on, right? So, I, I feel that it'll be amazing if uh, at one end, there could be unfiltered feedback corrected from the users because it will really, really help the startups. Wonderful insights, wonderful insights to have. Uh, so feedbacks are so important element for success for any kind of, what to say, any kind of way that we take in our life or in our profession. So. In that case, surely uh, we will keep the inputs the both of you have given, Samir and Ankita. Thank you. Now I'll come to the next two panelists. And I have a simple thing to ask because this aspiration is there in all of us. And sometimes we talk about it, sometimes we hint about it, sometimes we don't talk about it. So in 1992, we have seen that globalization of economy has happened. Now, in this era, how important is it to globalize the disability sector to obtain interchangeable information? Information means integrating data. Information to each other and from each other so that no part of world is in silo. 
So this is a question. Uh, Michael, would you like to start? Thank you. I feel myself a little pushed back in my former life as a business and economy journalist because it's the type of questions that I used to ask people. So uh, um, I now have to answer them. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's uh, it, it it might be the crucial game changer, and technology enables completely new solutions. Imagine what we're talking here in India. Of course, India is not the biggest country. But there are 180 countries in the world uh, that have ratified the UN Conventions of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and all of them have related or similar issues. There's not one country really sticking out. And in each country, if we don't connect these countries, each country in develops their own solutions. And uh, per definition, some of them are good, and most of the others are not good. And so imagine that 90% of the solutions are definitely worse than the leaders. That's more kind of definition factor and technology and our willingness to work together and to share and to look across borders con connected with the new uh, possibilities of, of technology is, is the game changer. Um, we, we experience this every year we at the Zero Project, what is developed in certain countries, it's, it's, it's amazing compared to other countries. Some people have really enlightening ideas uh, and having the opportunity to share this and learn from them can be a, 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 and, and is already, but might even be more in the future, the, the most important game changer. It, it, this happens on the, I call this always on the life hack level, some ideas like the potato. Even these are, are re reinvented all the time. And this is so easy and still 90% of people who are potential users might have not have this idea. And, and this happens, of course, on the, on the high end of technology as well. Some people develop amazing uh, new ideas just to give you one idea what I'm talking about, and this can really be easily shared globally. It's an invention originally from Denmark called Be My Eyes. Uh, it's, a, it's a really fantastic app. Everyone can download this for free. And uh, people who have experienced uh, blindness or visual, uh, visual problems, they just type in and uh, say, I got an issue. I want to cross uh, a street. Um, I'm, I'm in a shop, and I don't know if this uh, shirt is blue or or, or, or purple and types in and, and, and immediately someone who has volunteered to give an answer is on the screen and, and gives answers. No? And uh, this, this is uh, one of the fastest growing apps in our world. This happens right now in a globalized world and I'm sure there are many more Be My Eyes out there if we're working on this together. No, so I think just probably I want to extend um, Michael's example of Be My Eyes. I think the power of this Be My Eyes is also, you have volunteers from various part of the world. So late in the night, somebody needs help, somebody is awake to answer you. So that is globalization in some way, right? That is one of the advantage. But I think the whole thing when I was in Delhi, by the way, Delhi is looking so wonderful going and clean because of G20. And when I was looking at this whole uh, G20, I think the biggest, the three, if you look at was, one earth, one family, one future. I think that is where global, I think it is all about that now. I think we are all talking about globalization is there. And uh, it is very important because everything is, I think it is global. We have to kind of uh, look at that. I got reminded of also, uh, I spoke about this at the fire cha fireside chat at Zero Project. And it is very important for us to understand that the whole human evolution, which is, I think all of us were homo sapiens, which means homo sapiens is knowing people, wise people, we know, we all got to understand that yes, we are human beings and homo sapiens now. But what I understand again, a wise person told me that the, we have moved to homo sentience. What is homo sentience? Homo sentience is feeling people. And why are we seeing Black Lives Matters, Me Too movements, all these coming suddenly, all this is coming now. The reason is we have moved from a, just a being there to feeling, feeling humans. And when we are feeling humans and why it is important for this forum, why I brought it up is also for the 
sector disability sector is very very important because people are feeling people are understanding when you talk about our sector i think people want to solve i think like somebody said also that when you put up pose a problem people want to solve it there are so much out there how do we make it discoverable to the world and i think globally so these are very very important factors in saying that it's not enough now i think there is so much um we can do together and learn from each other because it's not what i know is the world i think we need to look at the world outside and that is very important and i think two three things which um, when i say um, homo sentience and feeling people i was looking talking to the startups and saying that it's no more okay to just sell your product this is the features of my product this is what my product can do this is what it is i think if you can sell the story that this is the product which is solving a behavior change happen and that is important to say that here is a child who is struggling who is visually impaired struggling in the rural areas to study or whatever it is and here is my product which is going to solve this problem of his or hers and here is the next product which is going to be solved and from there i think wonderful job with um, disc uh, social alpha and lots i think are good doing is we are looking at solving those products and if you kind of start like looking at how do i uh, scale products or services which solve the behavior change problem and i think that is the key because it's not the best products a simple thing like a be my eyes is actually just a volunteer based sim simple thing so i think what we are saying is that what we are working on is a complex adaptive system how do i make it simple and that is what it means and just last sentence basically in this globalization is i think many times we say that um, you uh, scale what works i have a solution i am looking at going everywhere in the world and trying to uh, talk about my product but i think the more important idea to scale is what to to scale what works right at so i think uh, the other way around saying that what do i scale make it simplify do not i have a solution i am going to start talking about it so that's important so that is what thank you thank you thank you all of us and yes we have a question there uh, can we i know that we have overshotted the time can we take one question Hello, um, I'm Rupmani, and um, like really good panel discussion. I have a question for you all. We're all talking about solutions, which is brilliant, and uh, this is a big gathering with a lot of persons with disability. But I, since yesterday, have not seen even one person who's deaf and part of the panel. Uh, so I think, uh, like you mentioned, if we don't see it, we don't exist. So. We don't see deaf people in in uh, in the panels, so we need to include deaf people because I I think I'm the only deaf person here, and I don't really know if there will be solutions for deaf people without having deaf people visible. So that's that's my uh, problem, and how do we solve it? Uh, anyone from the panel? Anyone from the panel that? I was just answering uh, your query that there's a second deaf person here, and I was also part of the panel. I was asked to take an interview yesterday. I do not feel, I mean, I'm just expressing my own opinion. Let's not make this uh, platform or forum into an intersectional war between different disabilities because the entire purpose of this forum is to find solutions for accessibility of all. And that is a very important thing and that is very appreciable because this is happening for the first time in India and we must take a very positive view of it. Uh, we all have the opportunity to express our personal interests 
like if you're a deaf community or if you're another visually uh, challenged community we all have different forums where we can express our views which will be picked up by them because they're already talking about a platform which is picking up all these problems and it's you know coming up with solutions which is for the entire spectrum so i think let's leave these inter in the sand walls and just look at the positive uh, feedback the positive outcomes that will come from this platform thank you thank you ma'am michael also have a point here thank you for the answer yeah, so um, since I'm also part of the organizing team here, um, I feel myself in the position also to give a feedback and I really appreciate uh, your comment and you're completely right. Uh, but this is the first of many conferences, hopefully, uh, and you're not, we, are, we, we want also to include other forms of dis disabilities more in the future. So, for example, we don't have a lot of people with learning disabilities currently in the room. We don't have people with psychosocial disabilities in the room. We don't have people who are deaf blind in the room. Uh, so there are other types of disabilities and we are fully aware of this and uh, be prepared that uh, this will grow every year. It's a journey. Uh, we're all trying hard also at the Vienna conference, which is 10 years old. We are working hard on, 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 on getting more inclusive every year, but this is a journey. But be aware that we are aware of the issue. So then one point, sorry. Yeah. So um, I think we talked about Be My Eyes. Rupami, uh, also there is a whole stall there which is signable. It's a lovely platform which actually gives service like BMIs for hearing impaired. So I think all of you should visit there and look at that. So I think that is very important. Uh, just to bring up our uh, context of a person with uh, believing in pan disability and pan world perspective, uh, I totally appreciate including all forms of disability all together yes we need to do that uh, that's a compulsory need not an option that's a need and also the same need not all is an and factor that i would like to say and also a vision is to be developed that there would be a day when all forms of disability would be on the same working coexistence and by integrating all forms of disability together on that table 15 percent of the population would come together and there after that we don't have to make demonstration and make policies change we just have to be there and be there on that table together policies would be made for us thank you thank you so much uh, thank you so much uh, panelists it was a lovely uh, discussion and a very insightful one we request all of you to please Pick up your gift bags, a small token of appreciation, and we will uh, move on to our next session. Um, so our next panel introduces us to the We Do, a global initiative for women entrepreneurs with disability. Uh, to tell us more about the initiative, I would like to invite Ms. Meera Shinoy, CEO of Youth for Jobs. Uh, I would also like to uh, invite other panelists to establish the relevance of this initiative. So I would request Ms. Sanjana Govindan, we do, to please uh, come up on the stage. Ms. Lasanti Daskon, Deputy Country Director, IFES, requesting you to please be on the stage. Meenu Mannarwalia, uh, CII Foundation Women Exemplar from Rajasthan, uh, Samagra, Rajasthan Samagra Kalyan Sansthan, uh, uh, please stage par aye. Rekha Srinivasan, CEO United Way, Shivani Kumar, Lead Gender and Advocacy CII Foundation, and Ms. Manisha Gulabrao Patil, Sustainability and Community Engagement Leader at Amazon, will be joining us virtually. Thank you.
good evening uh, this session is dedicated to women with disabilities all of us in this panel very strongly feel that whether in formal discourse or informal conversations one topic which is always ignored even by the disability advocates and by the gender advocates is women with disabilities in fact when i was just suggesting this in an informal conversation with michael and subita of the zero conference both completely agreed that this is an area which requires a focused attention and he in fact introduced the lovely lasanthi to us to this conversation um, why should we focus on women with disabilities if you look at these statistics the world report on disability says that female disability prevalence rate is 19.2 percent whereas it's only a 12 percent for males if you look at the literacy rate it's three percent for all adults and just one percent for women with disabilities employment levels are half and women and girls with disabilities are highly sexually exploited and we heard horror stories during covid all of you know and malnutrition for example we were in a government school where there are only girls with visual impairment and let me tell you the kind of stories we hear of the way the parents either they don't send them to school or if they come to school during the holidays they don't want to take them back because they don't want to feed this one more mouth this is the villages of india not urban india let me say so so looking at all this we thought that we should start working with disabilities we did some little work in the in my own organization during covid there were a lot our call centers were flooded with calls from women who said we all have aspirations and i think yesterday you know one of the panel speakers also said that that every woman with disability has an aspiration to be economically independent but she doesn't know how because no one's looking at her and exactly what happens in gender we all know that if a woman with disability gets money in her pocket she doesn't keep it for herself she looks after the welfare of the entire family so we started working to give them afternoon classes and mckinsey did a pro bono impact study on the work and the results were astonishing a reduction in sexual exploitation she moves from being a liability to an asset who spends on her education and the sibling education the health of everyone goes up so we looked at this and we said by joe we need to deepen our work in the sector and when the problem is large what you need is that you can't solve it alone you need to get people who are as passionate as you to work together so today i'm so fortunate that i have a panel for the first zero project india conference which is as passionate as me about working in the sector of women and disabilities so the first person i'm going to introduce everyone just one one line and let them ask them a question i'm going to begin by asking rekha srinivasan rekha srinivasan heads united way hyderabad but she'll begin by telling you a little bit about it's a global organization and many of you know may know about it it's united way worldwide isn't it that's what it's called yeah so she'll begin by telling a little bit about it and then tell you how she had the money she was looking for women with disabilities but there were no women who you could fund so over to you rekha thanks me now for the uh, introduction a little bit more about united way uh, we are ecosystem enablers so we are fundraisers we raise grants 
and uh, uh, we our vision is to build the capacity of various actors in the uh, non profit space uh, whether it is donor non profit partner uh, policy maker or business enterprises that actually contribute towards improving the human development indices uh, so that's what united way does and therefore work with multiple stakeholders um, there is a special interest uh, among all the stakeholders to um, work on uh, entrepreneurship space uh, especially there is a special focus on uh, women entrepreneurship space so that's the larger space uh, then um, when there is a grant available there are more donors interested in funding programs around this but there are very few takers and if this is the uh, context in which women entrepreneurship space is when it comes to women with special needs i think the uh, challenges are much more the major challenge that we face as people who have got some fund and some idea around where we would like to support uh, initiatives is uh, we don't find programs most of the programs that we have today which we are able to fund to a great extent are self-employed women these are women in um, uh, you know the beginning of their life with very uh, poor socioeconomic strata uh, these are people who want to probably start a petty shop or do some ho homebound businesses so these are the people who are coming there so we are actively looking for organizations collectives or individuals uh, of women who are di differently abled women who are looking at financial mentorship market and uh, export kind of an opportunity business development opportunity support but uh, as Mira said very unfortunately this grant is not being accessed at all so we have been thinking also with like-minded organizations to figure out how do we enable it so we're very glad that there is a platform like we do which is coming together um, I think there is a lot more data that is required, a lot more mobilization required, defining of what women entrepreneurs at various levels of businesses need to be defined. I think once we start doing a lot more work there, uh, I think we can also see a lot more people accessing the kind of resources that are definitely meant for uh, women. So this is where uh, I come from and uh, really looking forward for more collaborations um would be happy to connect with people who have ideas or who are already connected with organizations and individuals uh, who are uh, looking for grants like this many times when it comes to even women entrepreneurship what we have seen is there is a lot more awareness uh, and access of resources by collectives of women whether it is in the form of a cooperative they are a form of a self-help group and things like that is where you actually see a lot more visibility and forthcoming um, efforts by women to access resources that are available but when you look at individual women entrepreneurs who are not part of any collective but on their own looking or uh, the only merit that they're uh, coming up with is being an entrepreneur we see that one is they're not connected even with any of the industry forums in a very big uh, way uh, nor are they, uh, you know, tutored, mentored, are they accessing any kind of resources. So I think lack of data, uh, even understanding what is the need, why is there limited, uh, uh, you know, access to the existing resources that are there will help us identify the gaps and probably plug in and see what could be done. Thank you. Thanks, um, Rika, for that. Um, now, Lassanthi, I'm going to turn over to you. You're the executive director of IPS. Uh, what we'd like to hear from you is the Sri Lankan and the Bangladesh case studies to give us some kind of perspective of what's happening in South Asia, because we know geographically we all can really learn from each other. 
Yes, thank you, Mira, and thank you for you and also the Zero Project for the opportunity. And um, so coming from the, and then we've had these conversations on um, looking at the region and learning from each other because the South Asian region doesn't do that enough in our belief. So when it comes to women with disabilities in our region, uh, facing intersectional barriers, uh, is that when you're a woman with disability, um, they are not given the opportunity to live an empowered life to become the decision makers. And for the reasons you also mentioned, they are left out of the decision making process. And when there are, say, for example, employment or self-employment opportunities, these are mostly limited. It's the traditional few industries or handicrafts or making cards, very limited options that are given to them. They are hardly given the opportunity to make a choice, also because they don't have the access to the skills development, gaining the skills, accessing the market, developing a business plan, raising funds, and most of them because they've lived secluded, restricted lives, leadership skills, empowerment, advocating for policy change, accessing resources, the loan schemes, the government facilities. So all of these things are challenges and everyday challenges for them. And if you may give me a minute to also talk about what has worked. <laughs> uh, so in Sri Lanka, for example, uh, similar to the CII, there's the Employers Federation of Ceylon, which does work with women with disabilities, giving these skills to women in identifying women, going out to the communities, and also working with the business community to provide women not only the skills of uh, the industry, but the skills that I mentioned, developing a business plan, how to approach the market, marketing your products, because the marketing strategies, and we, we, we talk about a very competitive corporate world. Uh, and um, and then also what has worked also in Bangladesh, what I have seen is women's organizations coming together, including women with disabilities in their work, and also women with disabilities themselves taking leadership to promote uh, entrepreneurship, to promote women with disabilities coming forward, talking to young women with disabilities, bringing them forward, giving them visibility, and working together towards empowering themselves. These are a few things that I have seen that worked, but not enough, obviously, and we need to do more. And I think as a region, all of us, the South Asian countries, if we work together, and through your networks, if we connect with these women, I'm sure we will learn a lot and do a lot. Thank you, Veera. Thank you, Lassati. <clears throat> now I'm going to look at Shivani. Shivani <laughs> anchors the Women Empowerment Program of the CII Foundation. And funnily enough, you had just spoken about the Sri Lankan example the business mentors women, and that's exactly what Shivani does. So Shivani, will you tell us a little bit about the program because we can learn lessons from it and anyway, you're our partner. And also give us, be in a question and answer session with Minu, who's an exemplar in your program. I think she's just one or two of the women with disabilities in your whole program. Thank you, Meera. Uh, I think I'll begin first with my interaction with Minu and then from there pick up some things that we'll speak about. Uh, so I'll speak in Hindi and translate. Uh, Minu, uh, अपने बारे में आप थोड़ा सा बताइए आपकी जर्नी कैसे रही और शुरुआती दर में आपके क्या चैलेंजेस थे 
उनको आपने कैसे ओवरकम किया और आज आप क्या कर रही हो कितनी महिलाओं के साथ काम कर रही हो और आपका अनुभव कैसा रहा नीनू मंडरावलिया अजमेर राजस्थान से मैं जन्म से ही डिसेबल रही हूँ और मेरे परिवार के अंदर मेरे माता पिता मेरे पांच बहन भाई थे मेरे म, मेरे माता पिता ने हम बहन भाइयों में कभी कोई फर्क नहीं किया और हम बहन भाइयों को पढ़ाने लिखाने की कोशिश की ये गरीब परिवार से थी शुरू से ही और विकलांग होने के कारण मुझे पढ़ाई करने में भी काफी कठिनाइयों का सामना करना पड़ा स्कूल का बैग स्कूल का बैग उठाने में परेशानी आती थी ऊपर से स्कूल जाने के लिए दो किलोमीटर का कच्चा रास्ता तय करना मेरे लिए बहुत मुश्किल था उबड़ खाबड़ रास्ता कभी बारिश में फिसल जाना मेरे लिए बहुत ही मुश्किल था ऊपर से स्कूल का बैग भी नहीं उठा पाती थी स्कूल बड़ी मुश्किल से पहुंचती थी और जब मैं रास्ते में कहीं ठोकर खा करके गिर जाती थी तो कई बच्चे हंसते कई लोग मुझे देखकर अब शब्द बोलते जो मुझे बिल्कुल भी अच्छा नहीं लगता था लेकिन फिर भी मैंने अपने आप को आगे बढ़ने से नहीं रोका और अपने आप मेरी हिम्मत टूटती थी जब कुछ लोग मुझे आप शब्द बोलते गिरते हुए पे हंसते अच्छा नहीं लगता था लेकिन मैंने अपनी हिम्मत को टूटने नहीं दिया जीवन ऐसा था कि जैसे साथ साथ में ट्रांसलेट भी रहती हूँ फिर आगे बढ़ ठीक है सो टिल नाउ मीनू है शेयर दैट शी वाज बोर्न विद डिसेबिलिटी एंड शी वाज इन हर फैमिली देवर फाइव और सिक्स चिल्ड्रन हर पेरेंट्स डिड नॉट डिस्क्रिमिनेट एंड गेव ऑल द चिल्ड्रन एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू गो एंड स्टडी हाउ एवर द डिसबिलिटी मेड इट डिफिकल्ट फॉर हर यू नो शी है टू किलोमीटर्स ऑन अ kacha road on a road that was not very well structured she would sometimes slip uh, and the fact that she had a disability was something that she was made to feel by society because other kids would laugh at her they would mock her uh, there would be things that would be said to her which sometimes used to make her feel quite bad uh, about herself however she persisted is tarah se kathinaiyon ko paar karte hue maine apni padhai puri ki aur समाज के तानों और परिवार के तानों से परेशान होकर के मेरे माता पिता को मेरी शादी करनी पड़ी मेरी शादी किशनगढ़ गांव से करीब 40 45 किलोमीटर दूर अजमेर जिले के दोरही गांव में हुई जहां मेरे पति भी डिसेबली है और मुझे ऐसा लगने लगा था कि जब शादी हो गई तो अब मेरा जीवन कुछ अच्छा होगा लेकिन मैं गलत मैं गलत थी क्योंकि मुझे जब पति मिलना तो ऐसा मिला कि डिसेबल होने के साथ साथ में शराबी भी था और मुझे मारना पीटना गाली गलोच करना ये उनका रोज का नियम था और कमा कमा के भी नहीं लाते थे घर में कुछ भी नहीं था गरीबी का जीवन और बद से बदतर होता गया सो बिकॉज ऑफ ऑल द टॉन्स एंड द सोसाइटल डिस्क्रिमिनेशन दैट मीनू वॉज फेसिंग हर पेरेंट्स डिसाइडेड दैट दे शुड गेट हर मैरिड सो शी वॉज मैरिड ऑफ इन टू विलेज दैट वॉज अराउंड फोर्टी फाइव किलोमीटर्स अवे फ्रॉम हर मीनू एज अ यंग गर्ल होप दैट मैरिज वुड ट्रांसफॉर्म हर लाइफ एंड इट वुड बिकम बेटर Uh, but unfortunately she was married to a man who also had a disability and uh, that was not um, the only challenge uh, he turned out to be an alcoholic he did not go out and work uh, did not earn uh, he physically abused her and beat her and there was uh, much violence and she says that her life became from bad to worse shaadi ke saal dheer saal jab baad mein jab mujhe pata chala ki main माँ बनने वाली हूँ तो अब मुझे ऐसा लगा कि हो सकता है मेरे परिवार में मेरे पति को कुछ फर्क पड़ेगा पर वहाँ भी किसी को कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ा और फिर भी उनका नियम वही रहा वही मारना पीटना 
गाली गलोच करना सब कुछ वही रहा फिर ऐसे ही हालातों के अंदर मुझे गर्भावस्था के दौरान भी मुझे कई बार भूखा सोना पड़ा और ऐसी स्थिति की मैं काम भी नहीं कर सकती थी बहुत ही कठिनाइयों का सामना करना पड़ा बच्चे को पेट में रख के मैं चल भी नहीं सकती थी बैठ भी नहीं पाती थी उठ भी नहीं पाती थी बहुत ही टिपिकल जीवन हो गया आ, मतलब जीने की इच्छाएं मर सी गई थी ऐसा कुछ लग रहा था फिर उसी दौरान मैंने एक बेटे को जन्म दिया अब मेरी जिम्मेदारी और बढ़ गई अब मैं अपना खुद का पालन पोषण नहीं कर सकती बेटे का कैसे करूँ so uh, she is saying that life became more difficult when she started expecting her baby uh, she had hoped that that will change the family dynamics and people will work to so, towards supporting her but none of that happened uh, the struggle continued the hardships continued and uh, she finally gave birth to a son uh, which is when she i think paused to realize that if i'm not being able to look after even myself uh then how am i now going to look after this infant that i have brought into the world fir fir isi dauran rajasthan samagra kalyan sansthan se survey karte hue wahan ke log hamare gaon ke andar aaye jo ek prashikshan ka aayojan karne wale the wo gaon mein door to door survey karte hue mere ghar tak aaye उन्होंने मुझे अपने काम के बारे में समझाया कि हमारे यहाँ पर ऐसे ट्रेनिंग चलेगी वहाँ आप ट्रेनिंग ज्वाइन करो वहाँ ये काम सिखाया जाएगा पर मेरे घर वालों ने काम करने के लिए मना कर दिया फिर मैंने उनको समझाया कि ये अब मेरे घर के बिल्कुल पीछे ही है मैं कुछ करना चाहती हूँ कुछ बनना चाहती हूँ तो फिर उन्होंने हाँ भर दी और फिर दो महीने की ट्रेनिंग राजस्थान समग्र कल्याण संस्थान के द्वारा जब वो ट्रेनिंग आयोजन हुई उसके अंदर मैंने बेग मेकिंग के हुनर को अपनी पूरी लगन के साथ सीखा सो इट वाज ड्यूरिंग दिस टाइम दैट एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन कॉल्ड राजस्थान समग्रह कल्याण संस्थान वाज डूइंग अ सर्वे इन देयर विलेज एंड दे केम टू हर हाउस दे टोल्ड हर अबाउट दिस ट्रेनिंग अराउंड बैग मेकिंग दैट दे वर गोइंग टू इनिशिएट एंड दे सेड दे आस्क्ड हर व्हाई डोंट यू वांट व्हाई डोंट यू जॉइन so given the fact that meenu at that time was looking for some way to support herself her family and her newborn kid uh, she um, asked her husband i guess her husband and in laws and while she was initially told that she cannot work because again traditionally in rajasthan women are not allowed to step out of the house and work she convinced them that it's right behind our house and i really want to work some uh, work and it will bring some income into the family so she was allowed she went and she attended a two month training around bag making theek hai uske baad training lene ke baad maine apna kaam start kiya और शुरू से अब तक करीबन बारह तेरह हजार लोगों को ट्रेनिंग दे चुकी हूँ और 2021 के अंदर वुमन एग्जाम्पलर अवार्ड भी मैंने माइक्रो एंटरप्राइजेज के द्वारा जीता है सो द अपलॉज इज बिकॉज शी टुक द ट्रेनिंग फॉर टू मंथ्स एंड शी लर्न हाउ टू सू बैग आई वॉज हरिंग हर आप सुशील लेफ्ट दैट डिटेल आउट but essentially she got this was not something that she wanted to do sewing was not a trade that she wanted to enter she actually wanted to become you know enter the government uh, railway tum bol rahi hai railway mein kaam karna chahti hai she wanted to become a part of the government stenographer etc but that opportunity she couldn't get um so this came along she learned how to uh, make bags and then she got so interested or she saw such a big opportunity that in it that she says that you know everywhere she would see bags and she would sort of um, see the design and then figure out how to make them because they were taught only a basic design she also became a trainer within that organization she would walk uh, a long distance uh, take public transport go deep into villages and now finally she has trained over 13000 women in rural rajasthan uh, to start making bags and to stitch um uh, for this great effort of hers and for her leadership uh, she was recognized as the cif foundation woman exemplar in 2001 and uh, she still 2021 women ka uh, 2021 and is still continuing her uh, great work um minu andazan jin mahilaon ke sath tum kaam kar rahi ho unki uh, 
मंथली सैलरी उनकी आमदनी कितनी होती है I'm asking what's the income of the women that she is now trained. जिन महिलाओं के साथ काम कर रहे हैं उनकी monthly salary छः हजार से पच्चीस हजार तक है. They are earning from six thousand rupees to twenty five thousand rupees a month. और बदलाव क्या नजर आया तुम्हें उनकी जिंदगी में? उनकी जिंदगी में बदलाव ये नजर आया कि पहले वो लोग घर से बाहर नहीं निकल सकते थे मैं बता दूं कि हम लोग गांव-गांव जाकर के ट्रेनिंग चलाते हैं गांव का माहौल ये होता है कि महिलाओं को घर से बाहर निकलने पर पाबंदी होती है घूंघट प्रथा होती है हर काम के लिए उनको रोक टोक होती है लेकिन हम लोग वहाँ डोर टू डोर जाके सर्वे करती हैं और उन लोगों के घर वालों को समझाते हैं कि आप अपनी महिलाओं बालिकाओं को ट्रेनिंग के अंदर भेजिए जिससे ये घर बैठ करके काम करे जिसके अंदर आ, सिंगल मदर आ, और डिसेबल और जो ड्रॉप आउट बच्चियां होती है जो पढ़ाई छोड़ चुकी होती है वो हमारे आ, मेंबर होते हैं और उनके अलावा जिन लोगों जो लोग जरूरतमंद होते हैं वही हमारी ट्रेनिंग के दौरान लिए जाते हैं तीस बच्चों का हमारा बेच होता है जिसमें तीस महिलाओं और बालिकाओं को हम लोग ट्रेनिंग देते हैं सो द डिफरेंस दैट शी हैज सीन अपार्ट फ्रॉम द फैक्ट दैट द अर्निंग एबिलिटी हैज इंक्रीज्ड शी सेइंग दैट देयर इज अ ट्रांजिशन इन द वुमेन देमसेल्व्स द यंग गर्ल्स देमसेल्व्स इनिशियली दे वुड नॉट स्पीक अप uh in the community that she works in they're not allowed to step out of the house there's the ghungat katha the wheel the women have to wheel themselves uh and therefore this is a big jump right from them stepping out for them speaking for themselves for them actually earning uh and that has now changed communities right communities are now willing to let their girls go out she's also saying that the women that they focus on are women with disabilities uh, single women girls who've dropped out of school so the the more vulnerable of the vulnerable communities that they focus on and they try and bring uh, bring into their training so that they can become independent and can gain a voice uh, thank you meenu dobara tumse sawal puchhenge ho sakta hai meena ma'am puche um i just want to draw a little bit uh, from some of the uh, things that meenu has spoken about and meera with your permission instead of speaking only about well instead of speaking of the work i think Uh, lifting up some of our key takeaways uh, from the initiatives that we have done yeah very quickly i think there are three four things that stand out uh, for us as cii from the initiatives that we have done either through the ibdn uh, which is the india business disability network or through the iwn which is the indian women network or through our work with grassroots women leaders i think one of the biggest realizations for us is that none of these groups are homogeneous right so women is not a homogeneous group women with disability is not homogeneous group and women with disability who are entrepreneurs are not a homogeneous group and i think what this realization has meant for us is that while there is great comfort and there is great um, i don't know maybe comfort is the right word right in creating systems and in creating frameworks and we love doing that as well ourselves uh, we have found it to be most valuable when we have met them where they are at and uh, again this is something that i think we can say with very, a lot of confidence whether it be women at grassroots the rural women whom we are working with whether it be industry when we are trying to work with them around inclusion of women in the workspace or whether it be the ibdn network right and um, i think the second learning that um, has emerged when we have met you know whoever our primary stakeholder is where they are at is um, that if we are going to provide them exactly what they are looking for we cannot be the ones with all the answers right and this is a big jolt i mean we all like to believe that you know we we have all the answers and you know if meenu needs branding then shivani will just like zoom in and teach her how to brand and how to market and etc cetera, etc cetera. but the truth is that very often we do not have the service or the skill set required to provide whoever our stakeholder is their immediate need the thing that will help them pivot over the little hurdle that they are facing and so i think my third learning is um 
building you know building bridges building collaborative spaces where we bring in the people who are required to provide that particular service to the people that we are working with um linked to this i think uh, one of another realization and this was a realization that was brought to us um um most frankly uh, by women like meenu we have a network of over 100 grassroots women leaders who have uh, Uh, great stories of resilience and leadership and they were very open about the fact that you know we are we are very good we have established uh, we've done a lot ourselves but we still need more capacity building they were the most open about it but even as we looked beyond the women the rural women to urban women and beyond urban women to industry everybody wanted their capacity built right we are where we are but we want to move further how do we do it right so again building capacity being a very major part of i think all programs that we are doing through all our various channels um and again building capacity to do what right building capacity to just exist building capacity to just subsist or building capacity to lead so i think this has come up again and again in various uh, you know panels can we bring the people that we are working with right up front can we make them lead so even with our exemplars our entire effort is that how do we bring them to the forefront so that they lead how do we work with industry so that they can lead conversations around inclusion uh, conversations around disability rights um and i think with leading the last thing this is the sixth that just came into my head is recognition right because if we bring them to the forefront and a point that was being spoken about right visibility why does indira gandhi have to be the only role model a girl can think about right why can the role model not be from her village and we've seen that especially in the village, like meenu's village right there a girl can look up to meenu and say if she could do it so can i right there are other women in our network again who are like okay if you can stop that woman from going out and working i will also not go and work right there's an immediate reference point because if you can't stop her why are you stopping me right just because you can so stop her stop the force that is and then you can move around to stop uh, us so i think these are some of the points that have emerged from uh, the multiple initiatives that we've done around inclusion or leadership or even entrepreneurship um and it all comes back to context meeting people where they are at and helping them build capacity so that they can be in the forefront and can be visible and lead over to you meera thanks shivani thanks minu dhanyawad okay uh, we have two more speakers manisha who was supposed to be here from amazon who looks after their community initiatives her father just broke his leg can i tell them that So on the way to the airport, Nisha works closely with us and is completely committed to the cause of we do. So she told me she would like to speak online. Manisha, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Mira, ma'am. Uh, so I, I <laughs> yes. <laughs> so i would like to give a, a like a quick journey of amazon and working on the particularly on the uh, pwd entrepreneurship um, we strongly believe that this is the area where uh, there is a lot of potential for us to uh, bring our e-commerce platform understand where there are gaps into the current cohorts and create a kind of enabler uh, into the journey and here i am going to talk about two programs one is a karigar karigar is a program which has a small micro entrepreneurs or the artisans who are living in the village and trying to create their learning but somehow not able to connect it to the larger market area and we thought that this is the area where we can connect and also provide them the uh, right tool capacity building uh, to say that how the online platform works wh what can they do from their home and create their product to the global platform not only in a india dot in india site 
but also to the global worldwide site. So that's where we started the Karigar initiative. We have worked with a pottery or a chinnapatna and a lot of small, small uh, artisans. The It's like a fourth or fifth generation Plus, uh, this generation also have their families who uh, have the, uh, you know, the women who are kind of taking a leadership role. Because, you know, I have learned in my life that uh, there's a strong perseverance and determination which women group uh, bring into this uh, area. Uh, the younger generation, and this is what, like, when you talk to the youth, they are very much attracted towards the modernization and things which are happening around, which is nothing wrong. But somewhere the 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 ethos of the culture and the communities where they belong to is dying down. And that's where we thought that, you know, talking to the women or getting the women on board and making them uh, as a front seat is what have really transformed the program. And it also means that the woman is taking care of the elderly people, taking care of the PWDs, taking care of her uh, girl child and also helping her women cohort and bringing them along together. I want to just quote one example. I went to one of the community called Kulgachia, which is in Calcutta. And I was talking to the women cohort and this girl said that, you know, I lost my mom in a very early age age uh, and from that time I was uh, you know uh, kind of uh, brought up by my father got married in an age of 14 and uh, after marriage I never had my own identity like what who I am right I, I didn't had uh, the the uh, support which could understand me because uh, there is a always like a father is like economically I'm giving you food and I'm giving you things she has to drop out from the school so she came with that identity and uh, aspiration to do something by herself and also for her community today this girl uh, who have now another two daughters and she brought together the 30 women from the village they are running three businesses one is a catering where they are providing the catering services to amazon warehouses as well as some of the um, you know schools and the, some of the wedding or birthday parties and they go and they project the confidence and the uh, kind of you know uh, determination she got in this last three years is immense she goes to the various forums not only to the amazon all hand which is a national all hand but also went to one of the uh, dppwd forum talked about you know how this program when she started the entrepreneurship has also got the uh, the young uh, pwd cohort from her community to be part of this uh, while doing that, they also realized that menstrual health and hygiene has been one of the concerning areas because uh, for women, it's like spending money for the education for the family is important, but spending on personal hygiene is not important because they always keep others on a priority. So when uh, she took a challenge of starting the menstrual hygiene as a program uh, and started talking and today uh, they go door to door, uh, sell the same sanitary napkin uh, packet, which is a self-sustainable, it's a recyclable, it reuse all the biodegradable component into it in 20 rupees with the five napkins. And it has kind of not only creating the awareness, but also having something which is talked by your neighbor and creating the kind of confidence in each other and then taking it to the next village and then next village today 50 villages not only into the Kulgachia but also in uh, Lucknow or Jaipur or uh, Devanhalli every uh, unit is started talking because she goes and she talked to the women the language has been never barrier and that's where the Saheli program emerged and Saheli program uh, basically that there are a lot of self-help group there are a lot of uh, you know micro PWD entrepreneurs who operate from their own village and their own uh, uh, cluster or uh, kind of a hamlet. Uh, how do we connect the dot? And that connecting dot will happen when we tell them that you know what is the because the first insecurity is about a livelihood. I need to first economically stable then I will be able to help other. So that economical stability we have built through Saheli program. So we have uh, registered this self-help group on Amazon.in. Uh, we have built their capacity and uh, got the varieties of, because when you come on the online platform, you need a varieties, you need a trending uh, kind of designs, you need to have the uh, that kind of photography, you need to have that kind of uh, volume, you need to have that kind of uh, speed to the delivery, all of that was built into the program there was a series of the sessions were conducted and today 150 such micro SAGs 
and the PWD cohort who uh, kind of, uh, you know, benefiting from this program and it's getting bigger and bigger. Mm, uh, and it has also become uh, transformative during the pandemic because when they, most of the husbands lost their job and they were not able to earn anything and help, these women took ownership and they said, I will sell the mask, I will sell the hand sanitizers or I will do this, I will do that because I have a dot in uh, registration through Saheli program or through Karigar program and she become kind of a, you know the breadwinner for the family and that program become bigger and that's the same thing I think with the youth for job and with a uh, network they have through the PWDs, we are trying to see that how it becomes uh, a kind of more scalable and self-sustainable program and uh, a kind of bring that kind of rigor and create a sustainable livelihood uh, to the network. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manisha, for speaking to us from the hospital. <laughs> Appreciate it. So um, now our last speaker who's going to say with so much energy how can we leverage this energy and what's the kind of work we do will do is sanjana govindan <laughs> sanjana over to you all right so no introduction even good afternoon everyone uh to my deaf friends i'm going to keep my pace as measured so that i'm clear hi uh, and yes if you want to know my sign name you can learn from rupani sunshine um, so I was thinking about this conversation when we started talking some months ago and uh, what, what we're trying to do, I'll share in a story, uh, and especially relevant to our European friends this afternoon. So there is a part of the Swiss Alps, there's a train, Semmering, uh, between, I think, Vienna and Venice. It's one of the most steep, but also beautiful terrains in the world. And everyone knows this story. Um, the train tracks were built almost 100 plus years before there was a steam engine strong enough to even make the journey. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this is a lot of the times when we have this conversation on why are we solving this problem around women entrepreneurs with disabilities, in many ways we are building the tracks for the different kinds of solutions that will come. Uh, we might not be on the cusp of some of them, but we're getting started. So when we think of, I'm zooming out a little bit, and to begin with, I'm laying out the problems in the following context. So there is fundamentally a data problem, and we've spent all of the morning distilling the fact that there hasn't been a disability census since 2010. Most numbers we have are anecdotal. There are only dipstick surveys at best to give us information on what we are trying to understand. So when you think about data and from an enterprise perspective, as a country, uh, even globally, there is there are only two disability registries for businesses in the world, and none of them disaggregate by gender. In India, of course, we don't even have that information. Um, the other context around data is really in the landscape of incubation and acceleration programs in our country, and there's so many. Um, some Deepesh was talking about how if you throw a stone, you'll hit a dog or a startup in Bangalore. I heard you. Um, and the truth is, even if you throw the stone and you hit a startup, we have no idea about the kinds of services and benefits that are available if you are a woman entrepreneur with disability. Because for a country who prides itself on building the largest and most robust ecosystem for entrepreneurship, this space of finance, access to shared services, etc., for women with disability is completely blank. Uh, we can take solace in the fact that we're not alone and world over this is a problem, but progress is rarely linear and we needn't wait for everything to happen in steps. Uh, when you then move to the program level challenges that we have for the disability space, another context is we keep saying that we have the largest number of self-help groups in the world. I think at last count it was 12 million SHGs of which 88 million women uh, groups, women are part of these groups. So now the question is, why don't we have any information on how many of these women or groups are women with disabilities? It's not even data points that are collected. And then what's the nuance in providing uh, the right kinds of programmatic support, government entitlements, etc., for this section? It's a very simple solve and to start with something we'll try to do. Um, another thing at the program level that 
we've spent time thinking about, and it's early days, so we'd love everyone's input, is what does the user journey for an entrepreneur with disability look like? So we have several in the room today. There's Rupani, there's Minu, um, who, and the different parts at which break down in that journey are unclear to everyone, including us practitioners. But just finding out what that clarity is will help in so many ways to program correctly so that you're not doing this one size fits all. I keep hearing how we're not homogenous, uh, but we're not really solutioning to be bespoke as well. Um, the last two is on the policy front, and this has also come up. I was talking to my friend Taha, I think he's the Disabilities Commissioner of Goa. And one of the things, which is it's a quite an obvious miss, is that we have one scheme in the entire country which provides a loan to a person with disability. Um, this is a data point from the National uh, Handicap, uh, Handicap Finance Development Corp. So they gave out 10,000 loans last year uh, to persons with disability for their enterprise, of which 3,000 were women. Um, but aside from that one scheme, which was developed in 1997, there have been no new, no new thinking, no imagination around what can I provide to someone like Minu that will help her start her business faster, scale her business and sustain it. And so there's a whole policy vacuum in that space. And the final uh, well, problem <laughs> that we're going to solve, I hope, is the situation around partnerships. So there is no convergence either in the social sector with industry bodies, um, with the government around even an agreement of what to solve for. But just taking a step back and saying that, you know, first principles, let's figure out the data, let's figure out how to at least infuse capital into the ecosystem. How do I make spaces for enterprise more accessible? It's ridiculous that I have so many incubators and accelerators and not one of them is accessible. Not one of them has a program for a woman with disability. Um, and how do I build keeping a future focus in mind? So being very mindful and intentional about time. Uh, so I know I've given you a whole subset of solutions that we're thinking about, but if any of them are something that you're working on or thinking about, find us. Thank you, Sanjana, for the paucity of time. I'm not going to ask you all one more question, but if there's any deep thing you all want to say, I can just give you a minute each. Anyone has to say anything? Otherwise, I'll wrap it up. Any questions? Quick questions to Minu. One, two, three, none. Okay, then I'll wrap it up so that the next session can begin. Um, as you can see, it's just a story of invisible, invisible, invisible everywhere. And that's why we strongly feel that we need to build this solution together. I'm going to just tell you all a, a, a nice story, which like Minu gives us hope. We had trained some of the women in, to, in the beauty parlor trade. Um, and these were all girls, we gave them a kit, etc. And it's quite amazing, you know, it, I think any training, any money in your pocket also gives you a voice. The last when we saw them, they suddenly realized that in the villages around, there's a huge market in hair dye. <laughs> so what they did was, so we asked them, oh, should we support you in negotiating with the companies for hair dye? They said, no, 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 not necessary. We've also already, they listed to us who are the four hair dye companies and they were calling each of them to negotiate for the best deal themselves. So that is what when we can do when a woman with disability gets money in her pocket, because it's not economic empowerment, it's the betterment of the whole family. So let me request all of you here, your friends, others, uh, our social media post has given us an outpouring of partnerships from different kind of people. All of them are saying that, listen, this space, this issue has to be cracked. There's no other way. So please write to we do all in caps at youthforjobs.org. We are there to solve this issue 
together with innovations. And that's why we put this session here, because after all, the Zero Project is about innovations. We can't wait forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, all the panelists, for this grounding conversation. I'll request all of you to please pick up your gift bags uh, before leaving the dais. So our next panel focuses on leveraging vocational training for job creation. To moderate this conversation, I would like to invite Ms. Chitra Shyam, Vice President, Head of DNI, APAC Barclays. I would also like to invite the other esteemed speakers on stage, Ms. Aziza Ahmed, Head of Operations, Bangladesh Business Disability Network, Ms. Barsha Mukherjee, uh, sorry, Banerjee, so sorry, <laughs> Managing Director, Perkins School for the Blind, Mr. Praveen Kern, CSR and Sustainability Leader, Spark Minda, Mr. Daniel Van San, Director of Disability Policy, the Harkin Institute, United States, and Mr. P uh, Patrick Romzek, Bridge to Opportunity, United States, who would be joining us virtually, requesting all the speakers to please come up on the dais. Over to you, Chitra. Uh, you can please start the session. Chitra, you're on mute. I think we should be able to hear you. We can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, good, uh, good, good evening, everybody. So because of this technical error, I've been given the responsibility to start with this. So let me set the context. We are here to talk about the significance of vocational skill training for people with disability. And by the time Chitra gets connected, let me set up the tone. Well, the vocational training, how and why this is important, I strongly believe that if people with disabilities are connected with income generating activities, that makes their lives sustainable. And to make this life sustainable, we have to create an ecosystem, we have to set up that infrastructure, we have to create that resource, and we have to bring in that partnership and collaboration. We have been talking about it since morning, 
And I wasn't present here yesterday, but I learned from my colleagues that similar alignment of discussion of connecting such dots has happened. So how the NGOs, the government, how the trade associations, international organization, technical experts, subject experts, how we all join hands together. In fact, if you also look at SDG 17, which talks about you know, sustainable uh, goal and SDG 17 is about partnerships and collaboration for the common goal. If you look at it, the common goal of sustainability is clear. Now, let me let me just know once uh, Chitra gets connected. OK, and uh, let me bring in certain facts about the vocational training for PWDs. See, if you talk of vocational training, what is my observation is that this is more or less available in urban parts and semi-urban parts. The NGOs, I'll talk in Indian context, I have not much knowledge about rest of the countries, so I'll restrict this discussion to set up the tone as well for this discussion, deliberation, to onward to go ahead. I'll be talking in Indian context. Let me tell you that once you talk about the vocational skill training, let's think about rural India. 70% of the PWDs stay in rural India, somebody said in the previous panel. The infrastructure, the facility and the resources, are they available in rural India? The problem statement of inaccessibility of skill development training in rural India is existing. How do we integrate panchayat to the rural corners of the country? And how the people staying in these panchayats, those 70% people, they are getting accessibility to the skill development training, significant. Let me talk about the eligibility. We talked about disability certificate and uh, UDID, unique disability identification. Only 40% of PWDs have got disability certificates. Now these training programs, vocational training programs, these are there for those people who have got these disability certificates. Those who do not have, think about those 60% people, the problem statement, they do not have the disability certificate, so they cannot access the training program which is, been, which is meant for them, which is created for them. It's not there for them. They cannot access it. And if I also look at the services from the government side, that is why the result is here. 22% of the PWDs only have received some kind of aid or service or training so far in India because of all such reasons. Let me also reflect you some problems related to accessibility and infrastructure. 1.77 lakh PWD out of 3 crores, estimated I'm saying, they have been registered with Rehabilitation Council of India, meaning only they will be able to get access to aid, assistive aid who are registered, who are having disability certificate. Now see, if you're talking about vocational training, somebody has to go to vocational training center, you need to have the accessible assistive aid. If you don't have that aid, you cannot go to the training center. Let's also talk about the schools. Schools in Grameen Bharat. It is restricted so far, honestly speaking, to ramps and toilets. Are we thinking about a vocational training center inside the school for senior students? I don't think we are thinking about it. Problem. And therefore, the literacy with PWDs is 55%. And only 5% of them are graduate. I was so proud to see a panel before moderated by one of the gentlemen. We wanted people like them. They're just 5% graduate and we are talking about vocational skill training the result is that just 36 percent 
of them are in the formal workforce today. This is the resultant. So I have set up the tone. And Chitra, would you like to take it over? Absolutely. Am I audible now? Is the technology helping? <laughs> Wonderful. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm your co-moderator for the day if this further interrupts. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that support, Praveen. Really appreciate that. Uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, my apologies for not being there in person. I think I got penalized for that in the initial uh, part of the session. I know there is a lot of vibrant, wonderful conversation happening there in the room. Really missing all of that. Uh, but I hope you know we catch up with some of that essence in this panel today, which is set on a very important topic on uh, the need for enabling vocational training uh, and how we can create an ecosystem that kind of builds in and provides opportunities for people to equip themselves to acquire skills that are making going to make them relevant for the current labor market. So today we are joined by a very interesting panel uh, from across the globe uh, for this conversation. Um, and I'm Chitra Sundar. I'm from Barclays. I will be your moderator. And you already met my co-moderator there. Um, I'm glad we, we are glad to have this opportunity to, to do this discussion today. So uh, with our, for, without further ado, let it, I'll, I'll straight away jump into the conversation, right? So I will request each of my panel members to give a quick 30 second introduction. I know we are already running a little behind the schedule. So we will try to help you catch up uh, uh, during this session. So a quick half a minute introduction by each of you before we dive into the conversation, please. Maybe we could start with you, Praveen. Hi, I'm your co-moderator for the evening, uh, coincidentally. And I also work for a company called Minda Corporation Limited. I head the CSR and sustainability division for it. I've been working in development space for close to 17 years, member to India Business Disability Network. And very happy to be here uh, with all of you, a lot of, lot of NGO partners who work with us. I can, I can see them, Miraji is here, Enable India was here, NAB is here. So very, very, very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been working in disability space for close to 10 years, and we have touched upon some 17,000 people with disabilities lives so far. Thank you. Lovely. Aziza, would you like to go next? Hi. Hi, Chitra. Thanks that you're back. And uh, thanks, Praveen, for uh, holding it up for her. Uh, I'm Aziza. I work for Bangladesh Business and Disability Network as head of operations. Uh, I look after the pro, uh, uh, organization's programs and also the membership activities and business development. I was supposed to be there in Delhi today, but thanks to the visa complications, I had to stay back. And I really miss the energy that is there on stage right now. I'm, uh, I, I'm really missing it out. And uh, hello to everyone on the panel and whoever listening. Thank you. Thank you, Aziza. Barsha, would you like to go next? I'm trying to mix the virtual and online audience. Hi, very good evening. Uh, thank you so much, Chitra, and thank you all the organizers for having us here today. I know it's the end of the day and it's the beginning of our panel, but we'll make it quick. Uh, my name is Barsha Banerjee, and I'm currently the managing director for Perkins School for the Blind. We're a legacy organization which has been working for the last 200 years uh, in helping children with children and young adults with disabilities to get access to quality, accessible and inclusive education. In India, we've been there for almost 35 years and our core belief anchors on a very simple yet powerful statement, which is every child can learn. And that's the beginning of the journey that we are talking of today, we are going to be discussing vocational training and how education and foundational learning is so important in the entire piece that we are talking, which really enables a child or a young adult to have a sustainable living. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick, would you like to go next? Hi, my name is Pat Romzik, and uh, I uh, my legacy is in the IT industry. I worked in the IT industry for many years. I retired a few years ago, and I've been setting up IT training academies for people with disabilities around the world. Um, so my focus is really on IT because there's many IT jobs, 
and they can, can create transformative opportunities for people with disabilities, many jobs they can do. Companies struggle to find talent. Meanwhile, there's a huge pool of potential talent here with the right training and experience, they can fill those jobs. So that's what I've been doing. Nice to see you all. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Thank you, Patrick. And finally, Daniel, there. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here in person in India. We missed the other panelists um, who are electronic, but excited to have this hybrid format, which of course makes it more accessible. It's always nice to see that. I am Daniel Van Sant. I am the Director of Disability Policy at the Harkin Institute from the United States. Uh, my professional background is as an attorney, so I started my legal career representing survivors of sexual violence, which, as everyone in the room knows, is a lot of people with disabilities. Um, I then transitioned to working in inclusive education, so I represented students with disabilities against their school districts when their rights were being violated and representing individuals against these systems showed me how broken the systems are, or maybe the systems are working as they were intended to, but are leaving disabled people out, which caused me to look for a position in a policy space at the Harkin Institute. And so now at the Institute, we work primarily on the area of disability employment, working with corporations, governments, higher education, NGOs across the world trying to get to create a world where every disabled person has access to competitive integrated employment. So I'm excited to be here on the panel today. Thank you, Daniel. So uh, thank you so much, all the panel members for that quick introduction. Um, multiple studies and research shows the crucial role of vocational training for persons with disabilities um, and how it is important for them to you know, gain, uh, you know, gain that livelihood. So each of you are making it happen in your areas and it, and it is interesting to see the fair representation of you know, people from corporate, community, different industry bodies that influence change and uh, inclus inclusive champions like you, uh, Daniel, who are advocating the change in the society. So let me steer the conversation also to complement this representation um, and start with Praveen. Uh, so Praveen, my first question to you is, Minda is doing a lot of work in, in the space of disability inclusion by uh, identifying a suitable talent from disabled background and uh, you train them and you deploy them uh, in various roles within the organization. So can you give us some uh, uh, insights on how uh, uh, Minda organization does that? Sure. Thank you, Chitra. Thank you for the question. Well, some 10 years before, uh, we as an organization were thinking about uh, disability inclusion to our uh, organization. And uh, the best thing that we could think is to start with employing people with disability. It was simple, very simple narrative for us, but a very, very complicated action, honestly speaking. How it was complicated, we thought we talk about diversity, we talk about disability, we talk about equal opportunity policies. Is there anything that we can make instrumental and something which is visionary to get converted to action? We started talking about it. And in 2013, I remember we employed 49 people with disability with our organization. They were working in our shop floor. The journey was so difficult. We are an automotive manufacturing company. Now, employing people with disability in a non-automotive organization is quite appreciable, but in an automotive uh, domain, it becomes quite risky. So we had to talk to our production heads, convince them that we have to bring in some people with disabilities and have to employ them in your assembly. This was a lot of resistance, honestly speaking, initially, but we started with 49 people. Coincidentally, these 49 people delivered very good results, very good results. They were working with zero defects. The results, since they were amazing, the management started thinking about it. We did an exercise, an exercise of job mapping in the year 2014. What we did, we listed all the types of disabilities on x-axis and types of functions on y-axis. 
and try to do a match with production head, human resource person, and a CSR person. Try finding, understanding that what type of disability fits in what type of job. And then we did this exercise in 28 factories of India and identified how many positions we have pan India. We had hundreds of positions that we could identify, we can employ, but we did not have hundreds of people, how to reach to them. And then we started searching for partners, leveraging strength. And that is why when I set up the tone, I said, what is important is to collaborate, is to partner. What, what, is, what is most important in this entire ecosystem of disability space is to collaborate. We partnered with many NGOs. They become our sourcing partner. They started giving people with disabilities to us and we started employing them. Later, we also realized that these people also have to be trained as per the customization of the requirement of our factory. So then we started this deliberation with our NGO partners. Can you also train them as per our requirement? So many of the organizations came out like that. We are, we are so proud to partner with Youth for Job. Miraji, thank you very much. So happy to partner with NAB, Enable India. And there are 35 organizations, Pan India, with whom we are partner. They are just not sourcing people with disability to watch us but they are also training them as per the customized requirements of our factory. We have 28 factories in India and six outside India. And I'm proud to tell you that we have everywhere in each of our factory, we have people with disabilities working. We have 1,003 people with disabilities working across India today. We were also finding out some other routes to reach to these people. So we started conducting assistive and accessible aid camps. We have conducted many camps in different parts of the country and we have touched around 17,000 people and we also identify people who are aspiring for jobs and employing them to our factories. Later, we also thought of making it more organized and then we partnered with sector council people with disability to create a curriculum, a module for people with disabilities in automotive domain that we have created and we are in a formal state of bringing in and getting it notified so that people with disabilities can also be provided certifications and training as per the customized requirement of the automobile industry. So I would say, I mean, it appeared difficult. We, we did quite a few things. We, we reached to Panchayat, we went to blocks to conduct various screening camps to reach to people. Um, in the journey, we also faced a couple of challenges. At times, people come with 39% with disability. They said that, what is, what is, meri kya galti hai? If I'm not 40, think about this also, that only 40%, person with 40% disability can access a lot of things, the reservation, the UDID, and that yellow, yellow UDID, not the white one, okay and they don't get access to many of the services. We, we met such a, certain challenges like that. So the journey has continued quite recently. In fact, I'll take one more minute to tell you that we also found that there are people who are uh, reluctant to migrate from their places. There are 4% people with disabilities who stay alone in India, 4%. Okay, and there are people uh, who are reluctant to migrate. For them, we are trying to find out a solution. What we have done is that we have partnered with uh, IIT Mumbai. We heard Professor Rao talking in the morning. So with them, we got the tricycle customized as per the requirement. And uh, we are also one of the leading manufacturers of a machine which makes keys for automobile sector. So that machine is installed in that uh, uh, tricycle and it can go to the market and a person can earn comfortably like 500 to 2000 rupees in a day with, with this. So we have done this and we, we are likely to bring in this solution also to the market. So Chitra, a lot of things in fact to share, but uh, looking at the time, uh, I'll stop here. Uh, probably maybe later I would like to add a few more things if we have more time. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Praveen. That's an impressing, impressive input you have shared there of how you have, you know, moved from 39 people as a pilot to 1000 plus today. Impressive journey of how you have made the, 
that sustainable and scalable uh yeah we'll come to you i'm sure um, myself as well as the audience have more questions uh, on that but we will come to it during the q and a in the end uh now i would like to take this to the other side of the coin which is like providing that talent training that talent for you i think patrick your organization does a lot of work in that space and more specifically in the it uh area right so uh, while we right. keep talking that technology is a huge leveler it can also be uh excluding certain segment of people and that happens to be unfortunately many from the disabled background because the customization of content enabling that uh content accessibility are all different challenges that many are battling with today so tell us based on your experience of training persons with disabilities for it roles uh how do you work on customizing the training needed for the organizations uh, based on the individual's capability i would also like to load it up a little bit more with additional a uh, couple of other additional questions with the same uh, to ask you you know as you do that what are the barriers you have observed for their employment in it and um, to their progression further because gaining that initial entry is easy to place them in a role but uh, besides the initial employment what happens to their subsequent employment so over to you patrick Great, thanks, Shitra. A great question, and uh, Praveen, we're, we're, we we have similar experiences as as you. Um, the um, the short version of the story is we did pilots as well to identify what some of the barriers were to, per your question and how we could overcome them. And that's you know a number of programs that are go. We we now have about I think twenty four programs around the world. They're, we're not in every city. But we're in quite a number of large uh, employment centers, and we're we're being quite selective in terms of where we focus. But but at the end of the day, what we see is the barriers and challenges are very very similar. Globally, you know, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is quite high. These are jobs that people can do. So to your question, the first thing we have to do is identify what some of the challenges are. Some of the challenges that we see every day. Many times, these employers inadvertently exclude people with disabilities. They don't even realize it. Their processes, the way they recruit, excludes a large segment of the population. Many on the other side of the coin, the people with disabilities often lack the exert the experience, work experience, education, and um, even having a qualified kind of set of criteria or qualifications that they can articulate, like a CV or a resume. They lack those things. So you've got an employer who's not, you know, inadvertently excluding people. And then you've got candidates who don't don't represent either don't have the skills or don't represent their skills properly. So there's a huge gap, which is why we have a you know 80% unemployment rate around the world for people with disabilities. The way we address that is we not only provide them technical training that is specific to a job, it's specific to a role. It's not a generic IT kind of degree. It's a specific job, cybersecurity analyst. There are millions of cybersecurity analyst jobs around the world that are open and unfilled. Employers can't find talent. At the same time, you've got this huge pool of people that can fill these jobs with the right training. So we provide them the training. And it's not just technical training. You bring up a really good point. Another real barrier is their soft skills. A lot of times the candidates think if I get a technical certification, I'll get a job. That's true. If you have the right technical certification, you can get a job. But to keep the job, you need to have the right soft skills. You need to have the right ready for work skills. So another barrier we see is the candidates don't have the ready for work skills necessary to kind of maintain long term employment. So we address all those things in our training and specifically how we adapt our training to the candidates. It depends on the candidates. Every candidate is a little different. There's some general common things that you do for students that are visually impaired versus hearing impaired versus physically mobility challenges. We, we all, always slow the program down and we always provide very rich student support. So in every one of these programs, which is why we have a 90% employment rate um, because we're adapting the program to the candidates in a given class. We're not trying to be generic and do the same thing for everybody. 
But anyway, I'll stop there. I, I'm happy to share more if you're interested, but hopefully that answered your question. Absolutely, it does. I think, you know, uh, the point that you made about 90% employment conversion itself is a testimony to uh, the success of uh, what you're doing there. Absolutely, we'll come back to you for more questions. But now let me quickly go to Aziza, because, you know, she is working in that space that, again, kind of bridges corporates and uh, the talent pool. Uh, so, Aziza, uh, based on your experience of working with PBD and um, Please tell us, you know, how, how do you uh, enable uh, this talent pool to get placement in the private sector? And I know in one of our earlier conversations, you mentioned about a um, very novel initiative that you're experimenting there about uh, exclusive single employer spot interviews. And you also kind of compared that with the job fair option. So please tell us also more about uh, which of these formats you found to be more effective. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chitra. Uh, uh, in Bangladesh Business and Disability Network, we actually use a lot of various techniques to bridge the uh, employers with the uh, 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 candidates. And we have resource members in our network as well as the employers. And we have designed it in a way that BBTN can only work as the bridge, as you have already mentioned. BBTN can be the bridge between the private sector and the candidates. Uh, and with the support by the resource members who are essentially the organizations of persons with disabilities or organizations who work for disabilities. So with their help, what we do, we uh, actually organize job fairs, we organize uh, various other innovative approaches, and, and one of them is targeted recruitment drives. The spot interviews that you have mentioned, uh, we have coined it as targeted recruitment drives. Uh, what happens is we actually contact one employer at a time we sensitize those empl that employer for that moment we explain the need for inclusion and how inclusion can accelerate and support them in their business and inspire their entire uh, business uh, system and once we have them on board with the idea then we approach them with a targeted recruitment drive in that targeted recruitment drive, we actually offer them to have two or three interview tables, interview boards, and uh, we request a certain number of, uh, you know, uh, job requirements for them. And what are the requirement, uh, education requirements, what are the skill requirements, and all the other background information we collect uh, beforehand. And with the resource members that we have already on the network, we actually uh, connect to the candidate pool. Like for 10 jobs or for 10 vacancies, we actually connect to 20 to 25 people, uh, depending on the exact criteria that the uh, organization has given to us. And on a given day, we actually um, bring everyone together and we set up various tables for interviews. So uh, all the uh, tables, uh, there are like two or three people at a time interviewing uh, the candidates in, uh, you know, in lists, like we have uh, A, B, or C panels, and all the candidates are divided into three or four panels, and then they go around to the tables and give their interviews. Based on the interview, um, the panel can give us a decision on that very day, or panel gives us a decision on a day later or maybe uh, afterwards sometime and they give us three lists one list is the short listed uh, candidate list that they have already identified that they're interested to take they also uh, at times identify the candidates that they might hire on later date but not at that moment not for that particular time and also the candidates were not selected, but uh, they recommend that they require certain types of skills. So we also talk to the uh, resource members that those uh, people will require certain skills that they lacked in this interview. So once the process is done, we actually, uh, uh, we actually are able to recruit more people at one time than you know job fairs because job fairs happens very quickly. People go around and they see the they drop the CVs and and there's no particular drive. There's no particular you know uh, proper system to actually ensure that they get the jobs. However, uh, for job fairs, we also do pre matching which is something like the targeted interviews. We do pre-matching uh, of certain number of jobs, not all the jobs, and then we get into the job fairs. Um, through the uh, 
only in last 18 year, months, I'm not talking about the previous um, uh, recruitment drives. Now, in last 18 months, we had seven targeted recruitment drives and BBTN successfully facilitated uh, the creation of approximately 170 jobs uh, for five different employers. These tangible impact actually underscores the effectiveness of this method and bridging the gap between the job seekers and uh, job seekers with disabilities and employers seeking diverse talent pool. So that's how we actually work in this particular uh, recruitment, uh, targeted recruitment drive methodology. Thank you. That's that's yet another impressive metrics you have thrown out there, Aziza, for people to you know reflect on. Uh, I, I think hope hearing I from all your question. Absolutely, you did. Absolutely, you did. Thank you. Uh, so I think listening to the four of you, I think it's very clear that when we do uh, understand the requirement, map the requirement, and then train the people for those roles, the success and the conversion is, you know, um, more. Uh, for all, all four of you seem to have kind of, you know, taken the approach from what you're sharing. But for uh, the candidate to even go through that uh, training and be effective. What's uh, critical is the uh, foundational education. So that's where I would like to bring you in, Barsha. You advocate more for stronger focus on foundational education as it is important uh, for um, learnability, learning skills, basically. So please tell us more about uh, the work that your organization is doing in this space. Thank you so much, Chitra. So I'll kind of start with uh, you know, three things that I really believe. Uh, one is academic learning is not for everyone. While uh, we don't need to have all Helen Kellers, but we do need to have opportunities and access like the way she did. So like the way she had an Anne Sullivan, we need to have and give opportunities to children and young adults with disabilities. That's one. The second thing is that Preparation for future begins in the classroom from the day the child comes into the classroom. So therefore, foundational learning becomes a, it becomes a natural route or a path to vocational training. The third thing is learning has to be comprehensive and holistic and has to prepare one for future, right? Typically, as uh, you know, very rightly what Patrick said that once a person with disability is at workplace, is he or she ready to sustain that? So therefore, skills which are very, very important like work skills, personal self-care skills, self-advocacy skills, now, these are skills that you can't wait to teach a young adult when he or she is 14 years of age. That's way too late. You've already lost the battle. So therefore, today, we cannot see vocational training in isolation. And uh, what Praveen very beautifully asked a question was, are the schools really preparing you know, children for vocational training. Yes, we do have frameworks. We do have, you know, the nurses which are there in the country. Everything is defined. But how much does it really begin? And is it only when the child is 14 years that we start giving him or her options or choices? What is important is that we need to integrate curriculum which is functional right from the beginning. And at Perkins, as I had said that, you know, uh, we have been bringing in the expertise and knowledge for over 200 years. And I say 200 years because uh, we started when everybody said people with disabilities cannot learn. And I, you know, Perkins stated that every child can learn anywhere. And I feel very proud that Helen Keller, as all of us know her, she was an alum of Perkins School for the Blind and Anne Sullivan was her teacher at Perkins School for the Blind. Now, what is important is that globally, so we are, you know, we are in 16 countries and across all the countries, one of the most important thing that we are looking at is really school transformation where we start preparing 
children and young adults right from the very beginning. Because what is important is, it's not that, you know, you're going to be taught a skill and then you become technically qualified. What happens is you need to give options. So therefore, certain things can be integrated, which creates an environment in the classroom or at home, which basically prepares you for a future work life. So simple things like, you know, using real money, going and buying things, right? Getting into social engagements within the school system. And I think we are so academic oriented, which is so theory and subject driven, even vocational training is actually taught like another subject. And I think it's very important for us to really kind of move from the belief that, again, as I said, I, I, I truly believe that academic learning is not for everyone. And we need to create these opportunities to make really all options available and then let people make choices at the right time and those formative years when the you know the child is in school and is going through adult you know when the child is actually going through adolescence and getting into preparing themselves for life these are the most important skills so therefore foundational learning becomes a very very critical and integral part of pre-vocational training if i can say so i'll take a pause here uh, Chitra and I'll, you can come back for any questions. Thank you, Barsha. I think you know uh, the, the organization's legacy that you shared about, I think it's about close to a 200 years organization that you are working for when you spoke about those names and uh, the experience they have had. Wonderful to know about that. Yes, obviously, uh, we keep talking about how do we make things sustainable in the uh, livelihood aspects, but without focusing on the early years. Uh, you know, we are not building that, you know, strong foundation to really work on all those things. So thank you for bringing those points there. So on the same note, I think, Daniel, you also work with uh, many of the young adults and enabling that, you know, they get e equal access to um, rights in the society. So coming from the legal background, you know, please share what are certain general patterns of exclusion that you've observed in your clients uh, when it comes to disability inclusion and uh, how effective do you think different regions uh, are in adopting the policies to enable inclusion? Yeah, that's a really complicated question, I think, but a good one. Um, if I have to think about the legal structure around disability employment, I'm gonna try to narrow this down maybe to three talking points, because I know we're running a little late and lawyers have a tendency to be very talkative. So I'm gonna try to fight that stereotype. Um, first, I think, across the board, where whatever region you're in, when you come up with laws and policies around vocational training, inclusive education, inclusive employment, there has to be some sort of enforcement mechanism there. And I guess my background is mostly from the United States, but I think you can apply that broadly, that a law that says you have to educate all children, that's great. Are they actually doing it? And what is the punishment for a school that doesn't do that? How are you holding people accountable? So making sure that if you set up a system for vocational training or job placement education, there's actually some way to make sure that those rights are not being violated. And I think importantly, a mistake, maybe not a, a mistake that we made in the United States is that the responsibility is on the disabled person to enforce their rights. So if I go into a job interview and I say that I have a disability and the employer says we don't hire disabled people, I have to go hire a lawyer, come up with the evidence and bring the case against the employer to try to defend my right. But if I've just been rejected from a job, I'm looking for a job, I've been fired, that's the worst possible time for me to have to hire a lawyer and defend my own rights. So it sets up a system that prevents you from defending the rights if the paper grants that to you. And without an enforcement mechanism, that's all it is. It's a piece of paper with aspirations on it that's not actually going to change the system. So I think that enforcement would be my first point. Second, something that I see a lot in education as well as employment is there, there seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding from employers, educators, other systems that 
things like adaptive equipment or accommodations uh, give the disabled person something extra. So they have this mentality that everybody is here and if we give this disabled person an accommodation or something additional that they're going above other people. And at least in the US, there's a lot of strict laws against discrimination for a variety of backgrounds. And so we try to have a very equal access to employment across gender, race, economics, language. And employers have this fear of, quote unquote, accidentally giving a disabled person an advantage, which I think is ridiculous, right? We know that an interpreter is not giving you something extra. It puts you on the baseline of where everyone else is providing materials in an adaptive format brings you to what everyone else already has you're not getting something extra because you have time uh, additional time to take an exam or something like that. Um, and I, I think on that same note, if the law is requiring you to provide an accommodation or to provide uh, adaptive materials in school. This is not something nice that the employer is doing out of charity. It's a legal requirement. So I get really resentful of, as a disabled person, of always being told we should be grateful. We should be grateful we have this. You're welcome that we have these things. And I'm a little tired of having to say thank you. If the law requires you to do it, you don't get thanked for that. That's your obligation, right? I don't go around all day thanking every person who doesn't rob me or doesn't attack me. Following the law is your baseline. So I push people that it, it's no more thank yous. We want to say you're welcome. We know that having disabled people in the workforce drives profit. We had Accenture on the stage yesterday. We know thanks to their report how much this inclusion actually benefits businesses, schools, societies. So that's another message I try to push is disabled people need to say you're welcome for having us here to benefit your systems. And then my last point, because I'm now going a little bit long, um, I think on the other side of vocational training is inclusivity in professional training. So on the last panel, the, the presenter talked about building the train tracks before the train is ready. We need to create systems where disabled people become teachers, become doctors, become lawyers, and help break down those systems. So not just vocations. I completely agree. Not everyone is meant to go on for years and years of higher education. We need access to vocations. But if we have teachers with disabilities, that changes the entire education system. If we have doctors with disabilities, that changes the medical system. Um, so look to those programs as well. Um, I'm a very proud graduate of Syracuse University Law School who has a disability law and policy program to create disabled lawyers to practice disability law. And this program is also a zero project awardee. So I wanted to make sure I plugged that. Um, look for these types of models of how we can build that infrastructure as well. Chitra, are you there? I think Chitra has got disconnected. So or she's on, or she's on mute, Praveen. Looks like she's on mute from my end. Hey, Daniel, while we're waiting for Chitra to come back, can I ask you a quick question? You, you bring up a really good point about, and I know we're a little off topic, but you brought up the point about, you know, employers and, you know, sort of adhering to the law, which is fine. Most of them have figured out how to do that, from my experience. But I, I hear all the time from employers who say, well, of course we hire people with disabilities. Nobody's ever going to say they don't hire a person with a disability. What I see, at least a lot of our, our, our employers are in large metropolitan labor markets, so they're global companies. They would never say they wouldn't hire a person with disability, whether they ever do or, or not. Have you experienced that, Daniel? And what are your suggestions in terms of how to kind of get at the core of that issue? Because many times I think they say that, but they don't do that, if you know what I mean. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that sort of hits the nail on the head there that it, especially in the employment context, it is difficult to prove the discrimination because any employer who right. is smart is not going to say, we won't hire you because you right. have a disability. They will come up with a pretext. They will come up with some right. sort of 
excuse. Um, so, I, I mean, honestly, that is difficult to challenge. Um, I think we have to make it as hard as possible for them to turn down qualified applicants, right? So it's about having the skills needed about these programs um, for recruitment. If, if you're constantly putting forth disabled job seekers that have graduated from these types of vocational programs, they have the skills, the training, um, and there's not a track record of these em employers actually hiring from the program, it starts to show this pattern of discrimination, even if it's not blatant, you can see that they're going out of their way to not hire qualified disabled applicants. You know, Daniel, I agree. Uh, great, great, great point. What I find is, is what sort of separates the, you know, talk from action is when was the last time you hired somebody <laughs> with a disability? And tell me a little bit about that, either into a part-time job, an internship, full-time job, whatever. <laughs> I, had, I had an employer large healthcare organization say to me one time, oh, of course we hire people with disabilities. And I said, when was the last time you hired somebody? Well, we hired a guy about six months ago, had a dog. And I said, what? And they were talking about somebody that was visually impaired that had a seeing eye dog, but that was how they represented it to me. And it's like, really? I mean, that's your experience is you hired a guy six months ago that had a dog? I mean, come on. You know, if you haven't hired anybody, you're not hiring anybody, if you know what I mean. That's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah, and I, I don't want to take too much more time, and I want the other panels yeah. to be able to jump in. The, the second question that I always ask is, when is the last time that you promoted somebody with a disability? That's a great question. Uh, it's not just did you hire somebody, have they stayed with you for a long time to where yep. they have given raises and promotions? Is there a history of people succeeding, not just hiring entry level and every six months you hire a new disabled person to fill a position, we look for longevity. Are they on your board of directors? Are they in management positions? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great point. Shitra, I know you're back. I was just trying to Hi. fill some time by asking Daniel a question about his comment. Sorry, go back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for keeping the conversation on. Uh, I think, you know, uh, you made very interesting points there. Part of it I could hear, I know putting the burden on the community all the while to do things is not fair. Uh, that kind of, you know, um, helps me recall a comment that somebody made in the past to say that uh, it's not about uh, appreciating somebody about how brave you are uh, by speaking up, but rather creating an environment where they need not be brave, where they can be themselves, right? So uh, how, how inclusive do we think uh, and how uh, supportive can we be is, is a question that all of us need to keep asking to make this environment more and more inclusive. So I think with that, we heard comments from everybody in the panel once. So do we have one or two quick questions from the audience? We could do one question, maybe. Okay, uh, Chitra. So, Praveen, I would need your help there. We have dearth of time, Chitra. Uh, I'm doing the part of uh, the co-moderator here and uh, the organizers have just told me that we have to wrap it up. So if you allow on your behalf, can I just wrap up things and uh, close the session? Absolutely, Praveen. Then if there is no time, uh, yeah, people can always catch up with you guys who are there in person during the breakout time. So uh, Definitely. we could, you know, wrap this up. So we'll, we'll offline be connecting to you maybe for some questions. We heard about the trainings, it's customization as per the industry requirement today. We also talked about the soft skills and its importance towards vocational training, how we can scale it up, how good practices can be replicated. We also uh, talked about the rural infrastructure development and the ecosystem that, it, that is needed in place for this entire uh, subject to be uh, taken uh, from vision to action. Uh, Daniel, you talked about the law that this is there, so it should be enjoyed. <laughs> it should not be something which is demanded. It should come automatically. It should be something like a cruise control kind of a thing, and it should exist in the system. And uh, <clears throat> we, we did talk about collaboration, uh, which is going to be the key. And there are roles from different stakeholders to play. If the vocational training has to reach to people with disability to make their life empowered, and sustainable. So with this note, I would like to thank on behalf of Chitra organizers and everyone uh, to be uh, here in this panel. Great thoughts. Thank you very much. We can take uh, questions offline or can we take one? No. All right. 
So offline we'll be taking questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much, Thank Chitra you. and Kareem, uh, for moderating, co-moderating so seamlessly past all challenges. Thank you so much to all our panelists who joined us here in person and online. Thank you. Bye-bye. You are behind Bye -bye. me, which is why I'm looking this way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we have a big round of Thank applause you. once again? Uh, we now move to the closing and the wrap up uh, of today and the uh, uh, entire conference. And for that, I'd like to invite uh, Michael and Mira to please wrap things up uh, for us. Give me some. Yes, yes, please come upstairs, yeah, yeah. So we will wrap up this conference in a very crisp and uh, short way. Uh, and uh, we will first start with giving some extraordinary people that were part of this year's conference uh, a short stage and a short, a short um, room also to speak and uh, announce something and on, on the other hand also ask for conference feedback uh, and I hand over to you Mir, you start with uh... I have with me uh, you know my, Michael and myself were talking and we said we can't say bye bye to all of you you know so the expression of this is ova that means we'll see you again soon so the first who's going to talk about the conference is Taha Taha is from Goa, from the Commissioner of Goa's office. So Taha, can you tell us what you thought about the conference? And of course, you have a purple secret which you want to be leaked. Over to you. It was just one word I will say. It was absolutely fantabulous. And requesting everybody to put a huge round of applause to the whole team. To the whole team, it may be the team of Zero, it may be the team of Youth for Jobs. Absolutely fantastic. The kind of topics which were selected, the kind of subjects, the panelists, absolute exemplary. I don't have anything else to say, I believe. Thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, just want to introduce as instructed very strongly, very quick. So introducing the International Purple Fest Goa January 2024. A lot of events, cluster of many, 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 many events. Just give you an idea. In January 2023, in those three days, we had more than 90 parallel events which happened for persons with disabilities and for mainstream to understand the empowering persons with disabilities and requesting everybody here that please come up, be a part of this wonderful festival in Goa in the month of January 2024, which will have many, many things right from the think tank sessions to uh, the most funful Goa in a very inclusive and an accessible manner, right? This is the most shortest way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to, uh, when we were thinking about the conference, I think the entire Zero Project team was very, very keen that we should have a grassroots element in it. So you can see there were many people who have come from the villages of India who don't speak Hindi, but they're so powerful in Hindi, not in English. One of them is Saumya here. And Saumya is so, so excited to come to the Zero Project India conference. Saumya, why are you excited? Quickly. Uh, like, uh, this is my first time coming in a flight. It was a new thing to me. Like, I'm a photography. I used to go and click the pictures. Seeing a flight in closer to me was a big thing for me. I was so excited to climb a flight. Then uh, coming here was a big thing for me. Uh, I'm so happy 
coming here like uh, i met uh, many delegates and all the people who spoke about the women empowerment it gave me a confidence to grow much higher like person with disability won't be having a much confidence or uh, knowledge to build up right but the uh, women empowerment is a skill they need to learn much more even my, michael sir i spoke with michael sir and daniel sir and i had a lunch with daniel sir i was so happy with the to talk with daniel sir thank you thank you, thank you. so happy to be here thank you so um we also had a great exhibition outside and on behalf of all the exhibitors i would like to ask uh, uh, the, the both of you to join me here on on stage and also share your your experiences your takeaways from the from the exhibition with us the, the first question to you would be uh, give you a brief explanation of who you are and uh, and uh, then your experience on the uh, on the exhibition and on the conference hi um i'm rupmani i'm uh, deaf and uh, interpreter is voicing for me i have a 15 year experience in the field of uh, advocating for deaf rights. I'm the co-founder of Signable. So, so one, one second, could you just move? I, I need to look at her. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry for the interruption, um, minor interruption. So um, I think there were a lot of impactful panels throughout the day for the last two days, especially related to about impact investing and collaborating, networking, a lot of opportunities here, I think, uh, to make connections and what really important uh, one thing that i really liked was the base shared from uh, enable india an idea of potato as a solution which was simple yet innovative and a lot of uh, new ideas were here and i enjoyed myself here very happy to be here um, it's important to connect because i think we're all working for a change so let's see how it grows uh, there's one thing that I do want to, I want to give you an example. For an example, if, if suppose I was there and the interpreter here um, starts like, you know, um, lower the voice or probably you're not able to hear properly, how would you feel? Or the interpreter does not speak, how would you feel? So some, sometimes that happens uh, with the quality of access for me. I want you to think about that while you go. So I think uh, everything was amazing. The captioning in English and Hindi, there was no tech problem. Everything was without any glitches. I was so happy. Um, yes. So thank you, Zero Project. Um, because nothing about us without us. You're actually implementing that. And I wish you all happy International Week for the Deaf. September month is known for that. So happy International Day of Sign Languages as well on 23rd. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and actually, you're completely right. Uh, thank you for sharing this with us. And we can only create this more accessible, inclusive world all together. And it's not us teaching someone as the Zero Project. We have to grow together into this. So over to you. Uh, you also uh, have an experience two days as an exhibitor. Give us also a brief introduction for yourself and your organization. Uh, and your experiences and your takeaways. Hi, um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, my name is Deepa Murli. I come from the state called Tamil Nadu. I work for an organization called Varshini Ilam Trust. Um, uh, I head a project called Project Viday. Uh, it is an early intervention project where uh, we take care of children between zero to six years having developmental delays. We have a pediatric therapy on wheels program. We have two such buses with us. It's called a blue bus. You would have seen it in our, uh, um, you know, exhibition uh, place. Um, we are about a year old into this project. And um, uh, one, when, when I heard about this particular conference, I just registered for it. My only selfish intention to come here was to network to see people who work in the similar areas, to spread word about Project Vede, 
what we do get maximum connections get probably every possible you know learning opportunity make use of it um and i think that first you know thing on my bucket list to come here is i go with a card holder which is full of visiting cards uh, met a lot of people with similar aspirations um, similar pains working in the same area similar motivations um, i think uh, I, i'm so proud to meet all of you great organization great people uh, uh, it was a fantastic uh, program by zero project uh, cnn um, uh, mira ma'am here uh, all the partners i think fantastically organized great food by le meridian thank you so much uh the second thing in my bucket list i think was you know i was looking for a lot of lo knowledge sharing things like access austria access israel uh, automated taxis i think ma'am you should see our uh, bus uh we do namayatri what he shared be my eyes spark which i think ilo official talked about yesterday are all new i think they all have a lot of integration into the daily work that we do we meet uh that's all going to go back and reach the grassroots uh, uh, people and then we're going to spread the word, word around um that has been my next takeaway third thing is somebody told repetition don't dilute the uh, the prayer i basically believe in that a lot and today we heard probably more about pwd disability and we're going to you know more such meetings more such conferences are going to make a world barrier free and as chitra shyam our last uh, you know moderator said creating an environment where all of us can be ourselves i think that's that's it's going to be the future of the world thank you <clears throat> on behalf of the first zero project india theme let me quickly thank the cii ibdn sabani ki ki ti um sima and all the others who work silently at the back for their support um i want to thank gdi for its amazing support its young enthusiastic team our key funders omitiar for silently supporting us and adding value every step access bank foundation who came to fund the access israel's work uh the hans foundation who stepped in small but have really interest in supporting us more and michael will thank all the other silent ones thank you i think you only need one applause <laughs> yeah one person i would especially like to point out which is was a great moderator so thank you for everything that you did for us you guided us for the for the day you also deserve definitely a good applause thank you sorry yeah 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 i don't forget anyone so don't worry and if i if i do then then it's your job to 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 complete this yeah so the, the sign language interpreters did a, did a good job thank you for covering this the technology the technology really worked smoothly so the, the less you realize there is technology in the other technicians the better they do their job uh, and i don't think that we realize a lot so a warm thank you also for all the technology the cameras everything worked smoothly and also from the from the live stream end so thank you also you and before i hand over to you and whatever whoever i forgot um also personally thank you from uh, my personal perspective uh, and from the perspective of the zero project it was a first zero project conference outside vienna it was a wonderful experience uh, we are still emerged in this wonderful atmosphere here we are yeah uh, struggling to to capture everything to understand everything to uh, get these positive vibes uh, but what we can do is promise you that we are here not to stay but here to come back in in a, hopefully in a year and we work really hard uh, to make this uh, not only a, a one off conference every years but to use this conference as a fundament to build really meaningful uh, connections that support uh, inclusion and accessibility of persons with disabilities in, in India and also use what you have built here and never underestimate what's happening here in India also for the global zero project community so thank you
Thank you so much, Michael and Mira. And before we close this conference, uh, one request, Claus has misplaced his bag, the gift bag. And it's not just a gift bag, it has all his notes and stuff. So if everybody who has a gift bag, if you could just check if by mistake you picked up his bag and please return it to him. He'll return a happy man and we want him to go back feeling happy. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to just um, add our thanks to all the thanks that you have mentioned. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you uh, for being here with us over these two days, for participating uh, and contributing to the discussions. Uh, can we have a final enthusiastic round of applause for everyone who's in this room? Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to invite you all uh, for tea and uh, networking. And it's been wonderful interacting with all of you over these two days. Thank you.